We're live. Thank you. Sergeants, uh, will you begin the recordings? Recording to a PC, all set. Cre recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Committee on Housing and Buildings, jointly with the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. So I'm gonna <clears throat> go ahead and gavel us in. Chair Borelli, I'll, I will, I'll open, and obviously then you can uh, give your opening statement as well. <laughs> Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. I wanna thank you all for joining this joint hearing with the Committee on Fire and Emergency Protection, chaired by my friend, Council Member Joe Borelli, titled Oversight, Fire, Gas, and Carbon Monoxide. I'm passionate that our city council can protect small homeowners and our affordable housing stock and make it safe. We should not have to choose between safety and supporting homeowners and affordable housing. Safety and home ownership are not contradictory. The goal of this hearing is to demonstrate that and to support both. The most important asset for many people is their home. I'm extremely proud of a long record of protecting homeowners and affordable housing simultaneously. Today, we'll be discussing a suite of bills intended to make effective and reasonable legislation that improves the safety and quality of life for home and building owners and their tenants. We need to do a better job preventing death by carbon monoxide poisoning, but we must also make accommodations for building owners during the pandemic. Similarly, gas leaks have led to preventable deaths. And while we want owners to inspect their buildings, we wanna give extra time for these inspections due to COVID-19. New Yorkers have died unnecessarily because of gaps in our sprinkler laws. We wanna improve the relevant legislation and the purpose of this meeting is to start figuring out how. This hearing allows for testimony from stakeholders, including homeowners, architects, fire safety experts, advocates, et cetera. This is a hearing where bills get heard and amendments are made in order to make the best bill possible that takes into account safety and does not negatively impact small homeowners and our affordable housing stock. It allows all stakeholders to help shape a bill through public testimony. We have a chance to hear about what the current dangers of fires and sprinkler safety and carbon monoxide are. This is where we listen and make the necessary adjustments to both protect tenants and support homeowners. In 2004, the council passed Local Law 7, which required carbon monoxide detectors in dwelling units. This law was expanded by Local Law 191 of 2018, which required the installation of carbon monoxide detectors in commercial spaces. Local Law 191 was inspired by the damage caused by a carbon monoxide leak in a commercial space just blocks away from City Hall. Despite these laws, the city has suffered a number of carbon monoxide related deaths and industry, in, injuries. In 2018, an el elderly married couple, the parents of an NYPD sergeant, died due to carbon monoxide exposure. In February of this year, seven residents of a Bronx apartment building were sickened with carbon monoxide poisoning. Disturbingly, one resident had a carbon monoxide detector that simply didn't go off. In addition to carbon monoxide related incidents, the city has faced a number of recent deadly and near deadly gas related incidents. In 2014, there's a gas explosion in East Harlem that led to the death of eight individuals. In 2015, an explosion at 121 Second Avenue in the East Village killed two people. Following these incidents, incidents, the council passed Local Law 152 of 2016, requiring regular inspection of gas, gas piping systems. Even with this legislation, the city has still suffered a number of dangerous gas leaks. These include an October 2019 gas leak in the Flatiron that led to the shutdown of several office buildings in the area a March 2020 gas leak in, in Queen Schools, and an October 2020 gas leak in the Upper East Side where gas levels reached explosive levels, causing building evacuations and street closure. Failure to act means that small homeowners risk losing their hard-earned equity. That's why we're working further to expand and enhance outreach requirements by DOB. 
will work tirelessly to ensure the DOB to step up and to help impacted communities understand what these requirements mean. My goal, especially during the coronavirus pandemic, is to support homeowners and our affordable housing stock. I look forward to forthright discussion from all stakeholders today. I take it as a sacred task to protect the equity and safety of homeowners and protect their most important asset. I wanna thank my fellow council members for their hard work in proposing these multiple bills. Uh, and I look forward to hearing testimony from the public. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, I'm council member Joe Borelli and I'm the chair of the committee on fire and emergency management. Of course, we're joined today by Council Member Carnegie and the members of uh, both committees. Today, the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, along with Housing and Buildings, will hear a number of bills that aim to mitigate fire and explosion hazards uh, and prevent dangerous incidents caused by gas and carbon monoxide leaks. The fire department has historically and continues to do an excellent job responding promptly to fire emergencies and saving lives on a daily basis. However, the city must always strive to do more in the hopes of limiting the occurrence of deadly fires and gas explosions and protecting life and property throughout the city. In addition to the bills mentioned by Chairman Carnegie, the committee will also hear two bills sponsored by myself, Intro 1341, which would require certain open parking lots to have fire lanes and allow fire apparatus to reach all portions of the lot. In Staten Island just last year, we saw firefighters injured responding to an incident at a salvage yard where uh, cars were stacked and limited access was not uh, given. Uh, there's also pre-considered intro number 6926, which re would require all multifamily apartment buildings install carbon monoxide detecting device devices in basements and common areas of such buildings. Um, and finally, we also have intro 273 sponsored by council member Donovan Richards, which is in the fire committee and would require the department to submit an annual report to the council on the number of fire and manhole explosions which are responded to. And additionally, I want to uh, get more information on intro 1146, which is effect affectionately known as the sprinkler bill. Uh, it's very rare when we have uh, people coming in to speak in opposition of this bill, ranging from the real estate injury to community boards and block associations. So uh, I'm interested to see uh, how the city will be able to even cope with the number of applications, how this bill can be done without displacing hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and uh, how we can mitigate the cost on which in many cases are very small mom and pop landlords. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to council member Carnegie and, and begin the testimony portion of today's hearing. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair Borelli. Um, I wanna say that we've been joined by my colleagues uh, Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Mizell, Councilmember Grigentic, Councilmember Jonai, Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Perkins, Councilmember Cabrera, and Councilmember Shin. Um, that's who I see on the call. If I've missed somebody, please bring it to my attention so that we can announce your presence. Thank you. Turning it back over to committee council. Okay, I, will, I will use this airtime to reiterate that th today's hearing um, is an opportunity to hear from all stakeholders on the suite of bills that we're hearing. I know that I've heard um, in mass on 1146B um, uh, the concerns that the community has. And I echo the sentiments of Chair Borelli, who has articulated the fact that this is actually the first time I've heard from the public, the real estate industry, small homeowners, the affordable housing stock responsible developers, all simultaneously in opposition for the bill, to the bill. Um, today gives us an opportunity to put that on record and to hopefully come up with a methodology that will not only protect the safety of uh, tenants in these buildings, but also protect our affordable housing stock, not displace uh, tenants and not um, irresponsibly uh, add burden onto small homeowners through uh, unnecessary fines and fees. So that is what we intend to do today. Uh, thank you, committee council. If committee council doesn't chair in, I'll keep rambling. So I'm, I'm, I'm begging you. I was, I was muted by accident. Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, I am Janan Zilka, counsel to the uh, committee's uh, council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. Today, Department of Buildings Commissioner Melanie LaRocca and FDNY Assistant Chief of Operations John Hudgens will be testifying. FDNY Counsel Julian Bizell will be available for Q&A. We will now administer the oath. Uh, Commissioner LaRocca, um, John Hudgens, and Julian Bizell, please raise your right hands. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, council member, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, do you affirm? Thank you, yes. Okay, my council, Jillian Bazell, do you affirm? I do. Um, Mr. Hodgins, do you affirm? Sorry, yes, I, yes, I do. Thank you. We, you may be uh, begin when ready. Uh, Commissioner LaRocca, please begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cornegie, Chair Borelli, and members of the committees on housing and buildings, as well as fire and emergency management. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined by my co colleagues from the New York City Fire Department who will also be providing testimony. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the bills before the committees. And let me start by thanking the council, as I often do for your continued commitment to improving safety for all New Yorkers. We share uh, in this goal together. The construction industry is constantly changing and this department is committed to ensuring that our laws and regulations appropriately address developments in the industry. We look forward to partnering with you to revise the New York City construction codes for the benefit of New Yorkers in the coming months. Together, we will ensure that our construction codes are up to date and that they reflect advancements in technology as well as the latest standards for life safety. Now turning to the bills before the committee today, intro 842 and intro 1036 would require new and existing residential buildings 40 feet or greater in height to install luminous egress path markings and exit signs. The department supports the intent of these bills as they would improve safety for building occupants by indicating the way out of a building during an emergency. However, the department is concerned about the impact, both practical and financial, that these requirements would have on existing residential buildings, particularly during these unprecedented times. For example, a building owner would need to ensure that existing lighting levels are sufficient to charge luminous egress path markings and that exit signs are appropriately illuminated, which could require electrical work. The requirement that a registered design professional verify that luminous egress path markings are appropriately installed would also add cost for a building owner undertaking this retrofit. Intro 1146 would require existing residential buildings 40 feet or greater in height to install automatic sprinkler systems, like requiring existing residential buildings to install luminous egress path markings and exit signs this requirement would improve safety for building occupants by providing a heightened level of fire protection. While the department supports the intent of this bill, from our experience with Local Law 26 of 2004, which required existing office buildings 100 feet, greater, 100 feet or greater in height to install automatic sprinkler systems, we are far too familiar with the challenges a requirement like this uh, pose for existing buildings. For example, because these residential buildings, uh, because these are residential buildings, access to occupied multiple dwelling units for the purposes of installing sprinkler systems 
will present a significant challenge for building owners and will be disruptive to tenants. Water supply and water pressure in existing buildings must also be taken into consideration. Inadequate water supply and water pressure could require a dedicated connection to the city's water main and the installation of a fire pump, all of which could add additional time and cost for a building owner undertaking this retrofit. Additionally, from our experience with Local Law 26, 10 years may not be sufficient time for a building owner to complete this work in an existing building. This proposal merits further discussion with building owners to fully understand the challenges it may present for them. Intro 356 would require the department to inspect 10% of buildings constructed before 1969 to determine whether such buildings have party wall balconies or fire escapes. The bill would require the department to conduct tens of thousands of inspections to ascertain whether a building has a party wall balcony or fire escape. The department's existing resources do not account for the substantial workload, which means this requirement would significantly burden our valuable inspectorial resources. As such, we do not support this bill, but we look forward to discussing it further with the committees and sponsor to better understand the issues the bill seeks to address. It should also be noted that the construction codes require owners to maintain their buildings, including party wall balconies and fire escapes in a safe condition. Further, all buildings greater than six stories must have their exterior walls inspected periodically. These inspections include any uh, pertinences on a building, including party wall balconies and fire escapes. Any deficiencies identified during these inspections must be reported to the department and addressed by building owners. Intro 859 would require that the department conduct certain gas inspections within five days, specifically after a hazardous gas condition is addressed and an inspection from the department is requested. The department would be required to perform an inspection within five days. Restoring gas to a building is a priority for this department, given the impact a gas outage has on tenants. The department recently released a service level tracker, a new online tool that allows the public to see average wait times for department services, including plumbing inspections. This tool provides increased transparency to the public and allows building owners to see how long they have to wait for an inspection after that inspection is requested. The department is currently meeting the demand for development inspections at service levels not seen in the department's history and is already meeting service level being proposed in this bill with existing resources. However, we're concerned that codifying this service level may result in the need for additional inspectorial resources in the future. And additionally, the gas inspections, uh, additionally, pardon me, gas inspections can uh, be requested through DOB Now inspections, which allows for nearly all types of development inspections to be scheduled online. This is important because it's easier for our customers to schedule inspection appointments. It offers more per precise inspection scheduling and improves uh, inspection tracking and notification. The bill would roll back the progress we've made with DOB Now, which provides our customers with the ability to schedule their inspections when it's most convenient for them. Intro 1459 would prohibit mechanically exhausted air from interfering with natural ventilation sources. The department is supportive of further clarifying that exhaust systems must not interfere with natural ventilation sources. The New York City Mechanical Code addresses exhaust systems and provides that air removed by mechanical exhaust systems must be discharged outdoors at a point where it will not cause a nuisance. Further, the Mechanical Code provides minimum clearances uh, exhaust outlets must meet uh, which take into account other building openings, including those used to provide natural ventilation. Even existing buildings altering their mechanical systems must comply with these requirements. Uh, lastly, the department is still reviewing the four bills that were recently added to the agenda th uh, for this hearing, but I will briefly discuss two of those, um, which both uh, dealt with extending upcoming deadlines. Intro 2151 and pre-considered intro extend the deadlines associated with the inspection of gas piping systems in certain community districts and with the installation of carbon monoxide detectors in certain assembly, business, and mercantile occupancies. The department has no objections to these extensions, 
but urges building owners to not delay compliance with these requirements. With that, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. I'll now turn it over to my colleagues at the fire department who will offer testimony on the remainder of the bills on today's agenda. Good afternoon, Chair Borelli, Chair Carnegie, and all the council members present. My name is John Hodgins, and I am the Assistant Chief of Fire Operations at the New York City Fire Department. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the 15 bills before the committee today. When it comes to fire emergencies, the City of New York is currently in the safest period in its history. In the 20th century, it was not uncommon to experience hundreds of fire deaths each year. Over the last two decades, these numbers have fallen and continue to fall. Over the course of the de Blasio administration, the city has experienced fewer than 90 fire deaths each year. In 2019, the total number of fire fatalities was 66, and we are on pace for a lower number in, two, in 2020. The number of serious fires has also decreased over the last 20 years. This success, which has been achieved here and in cities across the country, is not accidental or inevitable. It is the result of hardworking and well-trained firefighters operating in conjunction with strong fire codes and building codes. As a result of thoughtful planning and legislation, buildings are safer and New York City experiences fewer serious fires than ever. When buildings do experience emergencies, both occupants and first responders are safer and better able to manage the situation. The city council has played a key role in these advances by working with the Department of Buildings and the fire department to strengthen and maintain effective codes. We thank you for your previous work in this area and we are pleased to continue discussing additional changes here today on a variety of topics by way of these 15 pieces of legislation on fire, gas, and carbon monoxide. Intro 273. This bill would, would require the fire department to submit an annual report to the council regarding the department's responses to manhole fires and emergence and explosions. The department tracks these responses and would be able to report them. The fire department has no objection to this bill. Intro 1341. This bill would require certain open parking lots to have fire lanes so that a fire truck may reach all portions of the lot. The fire department supports this bill. Intro 312. This bill would require all R2 occupancies to install portable fire extinguishers in a common area on every floor with at least one occupied unit. It may seem counterintuitive, but attempting to extinguish an apartment fire with a portable fire extinguisher from the hallway may do more harm than good. Our basic fire safety message to apartment residents is that they and their family members should leave when there is a fire, close the door behind them and immediately dial 911 as soon as possible. A fire may grow in the time that it takes for a resident to access a fire extinguisher from a common area and return to the unit to try to fight the fire. Opening the apartment door may also cause a draft which provides oxygen that can fuel the fire, causing it to grow and spread. The resident may be faced with a larger and more dangerous event when they re-enter the apartment with an extinguisher. Also, apartment residents are not trained to fight a fire and doing so can be more complicated than you would think. For example, grease fires in the kitchen are common and best, best extinguished by smothering. If you use a fire extinguisher not designed for a grease fire, it may, it may blast the grease fire with, with and with a burst of air that can spread the grease and the fire. The safest course for an individual experiencing an apartment fire is to follow proper evacuation procedures and alert the fire department by calling 911. 
We are concerned that this legislation may detract from that course and it inadvertently put residents in greater danger. Intro 1256. This bill would require residential occupancies with three or more dwellings that are part of a mixed use building to create a fire and emergency preparedness plan. It would also require mercantile occupancies that are part of a mixed use building to create a fire and emergency preparedness plan or level two plan. The fire department supports the concept of this legislation and the concept of preparedness in buildings of all types. However, level two plans are designed for buildings which may experience challenges in addressing fires or non-fire emergencies due to their type, size, or complexity, such as malls and other large mercantile establishments and healthcare facilities. Such plans anticip anticipate that there is a staff on site to implement the plan, including communicating with residents and providing assistance to the fire department. Additionally, the fire code already requires coordination of emergency preparedness plans in a single mixed use building. We do not believe that all mixed use buildings would benefit from developing a level two plan. Mixed use buildings with storefront spaces or other occupancies of limited size or complexity would not have the resources or need to have such a plan. Recently, we have greatly enhanced and expanded the emergency preparedness preparedness information and materials distributed to apartment buildings to help them address emergency preparedness. And we think this may be a better approach. We are happy to work with the sponsor to discuss how to best promote emergency preparedness in mixed use and other types of buildings. Intro 1746. This bill would re require any gas fired low pressure boiler that is not fully automatic to be operated by or under the supervision of a person who holds a certificate of fitness issued by the fire commissioner. After conferring with colleagues at the Department of Buildings and in the sponsor's office, we have been unable to identify any widespread use of non automated low pressure gas boilers. If these units do exist, it is unclear why they would necessitate monitoring by an individual with his certificate of fitness. We would like to know more about the motivation for this legislation before taking a position. We thank the council and the committees for the opportunity today to discuss this legislation. We would be happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Carnegie and Chair Borelli. As a reminder, if council mem members other than Chair Borelli would like to ask a question of the administration, please use the, the, the Zoom hand function and I will, I will call on you afterwards. Chair Carnegie, please begin. Chair Carnegie, you're on mute. Thank you. Before I begin my testimony, I want to say thank you to um, Commissioner LaRocca for, for being here. Uh, thank you for uh, Assistant Chief John Hoggins for, for, for showing um, and for testifying. Um, and I, and I want to let just the general public know that today is a hearing. There is no vote or action to be taken today. Uh, so I know that many people have reached out to my office uh, for a no vote on several bills. There is no vote today. We are hearing these bills in an effort to make sure that we could get the most, the best and most productive and efficient bills, and your input is, is greatly appreciated uh, in this process. Um, so with that being said, um, I, I believe that we were going to hear from or get statements from the bill's uh, sponsors, committee council? Yes. Uh, go uh, question? That's gonna happen during the question and answer. Okay, so I'll begin uh, my questions in a, in a general fashion, um, and I guess it's to, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, uh, does DOB keep track of fire, gas, and carbon monoxide incidences that occur in the city? So uh, thank you, Chair. The department um, uh, does not keep track of those incidences. Um, however, we do play an important role in that um, our colleagues at FIRE, who are our first responders, will on a number of occasions request the services of the department for incidences that fall within um, one of those three that you mentioned. So we do certainly respond to incidences where department resources are needed. 
typically that does look um, at um, uh, structural concerns related to fire. So, so I guess the, the same question I would pose to FDNY, does FDNY keep track of fire, gas, and carbon monoxide incidences that occur in the city? Well, yes, if we receive a 911 call or an alarm through a different um, you know, transmission method, um, we um, go to the scene to mitigate the emergency. All of these actions and this response is, is tracked in our, in our CAD system, which is our computer assist dispatch system. So yes, I mean, we do have records of these incidents um, in, in, uh, in, our, in our CAD system. So, so who and where can uh, this warehouse of information be accessed? Can it be accessed from the general public? Can it be accessed from the council? Or is it just an internal uh, uh, kind of mechanism that you, that you keep that? For the most part, it's an internal mechanism. It is available on open source data. Um, it may not be broken down into individual addresses, but the, um, the, the information is available as to how many incidents the department has responded to. Uh, and I, I think it's important for us to know that as we're crafting bills that we think anecdotally we're getting information on, on some of these incidences, it would be great to be able to have uh, as a resource um, uh, that system uh, access to us. And you said by open source, we can get it. But I certainly, as the chair of the committee, would like to have a, a, a more effective and efficient way to share that information with the council, at least with this committee. Yes, um, you know, we, we, um, we would be open to uh, further discussion on, on providing you know, that type of information. Yeah, I, I wasn't trying to nail you to the wall on that one, oh. uh, Assistant Chief. So yes, I'd like to offline talk about how we can do that and have a better line of communication on these incidences that take place so we could better craft legislation jointly uh, around safety. So uh, I look forward to that. Um, but what's the process for reporting, I'm sorry, uh, is DOP the proper entity to receive and respond to reports of these incidents? I know that you, you know, you get your colleagues from FDNY and from other places um, to report this information. Uh, is that the best system for DOB? Um, and if not, what would be a better uh, system for DOB to have that information? Yeah, I mean, I would say obviously for anybody who has a circumstance. Uh, for one of those three that you mentioned, Chair, obviously 911 is the right response, immediate response for any individual. Um, and yes, I think the process we have with fire department is exceptional. We have a great partnership between our two agencies um, and work very closely together to ensure uh, that our buildings are safe for occupants. So yes. So, so gas leakages that are reported are generally done directly from the three. Uh, you get that information from the three one one system. Is it self reporting? Can someone else report? What's the mechanism for reporting uh, gas leakages or fire code violations? So I'll start and fire. You can chime in on on the second part there. But obviously, the bulk of the work from the Department of Buildings is through the three one one system, and we think that system is very uh, works very well for us. It provides the uh, community with a level of transparency since those complaints do live on our uh, website at the associated address um, where a complaint comes in. So, so we think the transparency that that system has right now for us is a very beneficial one. Fire, if you wanna add more. Thank you, John. For a gas leak, that's considered a, you know, an, an immediate uh, emergency and we would, uh, the best method for you know, notifying us would be through 911 and we would have an immediate response to any type of gas leak. As far as fire code violations, um, they could be reported through the 311 system. And we will address through our complaints as a complaint process. Do, do either one of the agencies know how many um, uh, gas leak reports from 311 came in in 2019? Or any subsequent years? Um, so you're asking about 311. I am unaware of, of uh, how many they are, but we can we can look into it and, and uh, get back to you with that. Again, I just think that that's pertinent information to be able to uh, really drill down on legislation that um, gets to the safety issues that we want to address today, but also doesn't target 
um, small homeowners or affordable housing stock or those kind of things. That I think the, the, the more we drill down and the more central we can get to those reports, um, we'll have a better picture on where we should be focusing uh, the legislation. So, so thank you. Uh, and again, offline, um, I, I'd like to have a conversation with you about uh, those annual reports, um, yes. especially for 2019. From the fire department perspective, we continually message that for any type of gas leak or order of gas to call 911. Um, it's, it's an emergency that requires a response, uh, an immediate response of our units. Um, so, we, you know, the, the best method of, of uh, reporting a gas leak is definitely through the 911 system. Okay. Um, and then lastly, before I, I, I throw to my, my, my colleague and co-chair, Joe Borelli, um, what measures, uh, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, what measures does DOB have in place to ensure proper certification of fire, gas, and carbon monoxide incident prevention within the buildings inspected? Certainly. So with respect to uh, carbon monoxide and, uh, and fire, uh, the department does not perform proactive inspections around um, uh, these devices and the functionality of them. Uh, we certainly do review plans uh, to ascertain whether carbon monoxide uh, devices are appropriately installed in a building uh, that is being constructed or where you have major alterations uh, to a building or a space. Um, and I will note that the construction code uh, does uh, establish a maintenance requirement for um, particularly carbon monoxide detectors uh, devices and requires that they're periodically replaced um, that is on top of uh, the housing maintenance code uh, that requires for residential buildings owners to do uh, effectively the same. Uh, so the remainder of my questions, I will come back on a second round. I throw or pass um, the baton to my uh, co-chair, uh, Councilmember Borelli. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for handing it over to me for a brief second. Um, I have questions about intro 1146, but I just want to, uh, I wanna ask uh, the uh, assistant chief if he, uh, I mean, frankly, if he misses seeing me in the gym, that's, that's what I really wanna, I wanna know about. <laughs> I don't think he's listening. Oh, in the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah now I'm in, uh, again, we're in, uh, we're, we're closed down for a little while. Unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Um, Commissioner LaRocca, I just, you mentioned intro 26 of 2004 and you, you referenced some of the problems uh, that have arisen from that. So do you know what was the timeline written into that bill? I tried to look it up, to be honest, while we were doing this, I just didn't have time. Uh, but do you remember what the timeline was for that bill? 15 years. So we have just crossed that threshold. Are we in 100% compliance? Uh, we are uh, not at 100% compliance, and certainly while we've seen the number of buildings um, move forward um, and uh, come into compliance with uh, Local Law 26, as of uh, this moment, we're at about 52%. So half, uh, half roughly are done within the time frame prescribed by law. Can you just go through some of the challenges that um, have resulted in that non-compliance? You know, I think we've heard certainly from owners who have expressed uh, a concern around um, uh, the uh, lack of vacancy uh, in the units with uh, that being a uh, limitation on their ability to get in and uh, sprinkler those spaces. And again, um, Local Law 26 of 2004 was specific to commercial buildings. Um, and so that is, you know, certainly a challenge. Um, um, it does require a significant investment of resources, as well as, um, you know, the need to look at your building system to ensure that you have the capacity to increase um, uh, uh, service on the water. And can, can you just explain how long uh, the Department of Buildings procedure is, or how long it takes? from when uh, an architect or engineer files for the sprinkler permit to when it's finally signed off on? Um, 
respectfully, council member, a lot of that is dependent on the applicant and their ability to uh, submit to the department code compliant documentation. So I will say this, our uh, turner, I'm sorry, I uh, got a little feedback there. So our turnaround time um, for first reviews of uh, applications uh, is probably at our, our best levels that we've seen um, in modern history for the department. So you're looking at an application that is received from the department and you're under 10 days um, for that first review. So our, I feel very confident in our ability to review documentation. Um, and I certainly feel equally as strong when it comes to the uh, end of that process for uh, inspection sign off. Again, an area where we've seen tremendous. Yeah, my, my, my question wasn't meant to be a criticism of the length of time, but rather um, how many people does it take in your department to provide that turnaround time? I mean, that's, uh, you know, it is a team effort to do that, right? You have uh, applications that are submitted that take the, I apologize, my lights turned off, <laughs> that take the work of the borough office that those are submitted to. So um, hard to quantify an exact number. I'd be happy to come back to you um, with you know a more refined are? answer. Do we know how many buildings there are that are covered by intro 26 or how many hundred story buildings there are? Uh, of intro 26 of 2004, the number is 1,321. And is that, so right, so that, that, that's, I mean, to me, that sounds like a workable number in 15 years. Do we even have an estimate on how many buildings are over 40 feet tall in the city of New York? Uh, I am looking, I thought I had a estimate, but uh, about 85,000. So, you know, we're, we're, talking a significantly more, a significantly larger number of buildings that would have to go through almost an identical process to buildings that are over 100 stories, albeit the, the plans might not be as complex or as elaborate or large, but the process is, is roughly the same. Correct. And it would take perhaps 85 times as many people for your agency to provide the same turnaround time in terms of man hours as it would to provide the level of service you're providing now to the 1000 and change buildings that we're dealing with. I could certainly see a universe where additional uh, work for this population of approximately 85,000 buildings would have an impact in our staffing. Frankly speaking, I mean, this would be something that would be tremendously burdensome on the agency with current manpower levels. We are currently not staffed to accommodate this. Um, can, can you go through some of the, um, and this might be secondhand, and if it is secondhand, I think we have other people coming up, but in your experience, what has been some of the hardships faced by tenants of intro 26? You know, I would defer to owners who could speak more accurately about the interactions they're having with their tenants, but I will say broadly speaking, we do know that um, the installation of sprinklers can be um, um, uh, invasive work. It does require the removal of certain portions of wall. Um, uh, so that is certainly a uh, true uh, statement that you know sprinkler work is um, very much so, uh, 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 you know, a real um, amount of labor. That being said, again, as I mentioned in my testimony. Um, you know, we are certainly as a department uh, very interested in any uh, opportunity to discuss improvements um, to safety and certainly uh, uh, do believe that sprinklers are an element um, to help uh, uh, move that forward. In, in your experience, is, is the work typically done by um, using an existing water main to charge the lines or is a separate water main needed that could be uh, could ascend through common areas? Um, it would be an uh, individual building assessment. But in a, in a building that might be 41 stories, uh, 41 feet high, um, we're not talking the type of building that might have some, some central chamber with which they can put these lines that go vertical easily in, correct? Again, I would defer to the individual nature of a building and how it's designed, but I could certainly uh, see a scenario where there would be uh, a need to have uh, uh, some work done in order to accommodate 
um, the system. Okay, well, I, I will leave it at that. Um, I mean, to be honest, I think all the other bills we're hearing today, uh, um, we, we could spend some time talking about them, but I don't think any of them really come to the same threshold as intro 1146, because with 1146, we are potentially looking at displacing hundreds of thousands of residents uh, with an extremely costly process uh, with a potential uh, bureaucratic nightmare because we don't have the staffing to handle 85% or 85 times more applications than this. But I will turn it back to uh, Chairman Cornegie and uh, we will move on from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that line of questioning, uh, Chair Borelli. Um, I want to uh, let us know that we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Brennan, Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Rodriguez, and Councilmember Deutsch. Um, I think it's we are at that point where we'll hear from colleagues um, who will ask questions first from the sponsors of bills, and they will have five minutes on the clock uh, to talk about their bill and to ask any question that they may seem may feel that's relevant uh, to this hearing. So committee council, we have five minutes on the clock for bill sponsors at this point. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I will now call on um, council members to ask questions. First, I will go by sponsors of bills that are being heard today. So if you're a sponsor of a bill, please raise your hand. Um, for uh, openings, uh, for, uh, sorry, for sponsors who are making statements, we are limiting it to five minutes. Otherwise, questions will be three minutes. Um, um, there will be uh, three minutes allotted for the second round of questioning. Um, first, we're gonna go to council member Grudenchik. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you chairs. Um, uh, my chair and uh, Carnegie and Chair Borelli, I thank you for holding this hearing. I would like to read a brief statement and then I, I probably will have a question uh, for the fire department. Um, I'm pleased today to have three bills that are being heard during this hearing, and they all relate to fire safety. Uh, we have heard about intro 842, which would require owners of all new and existing buildings 40 feet or higher to install luminous egress path markings to delineate an exit path, making getting out of a smoking uh, fire much easier. Intro 1036 would require uh, as well uh, installing directional signs in buildings 40 feet or higher. And um, what seems to be the main topic of concern today, uh, intro 1146B would require owners of residential buildings over 40 feet tall to install automatic sprinklers uh, by the end of this decade. The original plan on uh, this bill was drafted a couple of years ago. I wanna uh, add to that uh, was for upgrades to take place over a 10 year period. I, I understand and I've heard the concerns and I foresee amendments to this bill um, that would track that 10 year plan. Uh, building owners would uh, need to file an interim report describing a plan for compliance over several uh, year period of time. And this bill, as has been mentioned, was modeled after local uh, 2004 local law that required commercial buildings uh, to retrofit with sprinkles. Uh, I am not oblivious to the need uh, for financing here in, um, a year ago, we have asked for legislation to be drafted that would accompany this bill um, that would give either um, tax credits or um, uh, very, very reasonable loans. And again, that was before the pandemic hit. Uh, these bills were drafted uh, in the wake of uh, several very severe fires that occurred in New York City. Um, which were quite deadly um, and among the deadliest fires that had occurred over the past quarter century. Uh, having said all that, I have heard from um, many people, my colleagues included, I have met uh, via Zoom meetings uh, with associations. I've heard from individual owners and co-ops in my district and I know that my colleagues have as well. And um, the bills, of course, were drafted with the idea that uh, we promote as best as possible um, public safety. And I guess my, my question would be for the FDNY, although it's always good to see Commissioner LaRocca, um, the FDNY, uh, outside of um, Sprinkler's chief, because um, I'm not 
on Chair Borelli's committee, um, but I am on this committee, uh, Housing and Buildings. Uh, outside of sprinklers, what's the single most important thing? I know we have laws um, for uh, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, and I, I would be interested in hearing your opinion um, on uh, how important it would be to retrofit buildings and what other steps we could take as we go forward. And I know we're gonna hear from a lot of people today and I look forward to hearing from people about our bills today as well. So Chief, if you could. Yes, um, so uh, automatic sprinkler systems are uh, always a positive things. Uh, Thing to have when uh, to mitigate, you know, fires. Uh, they 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 give you early detection, and um, immediately, you know, apply water to the fire. I mean, for our, from fire department's perspective, uh, sprinkler systems are a good thing. Uh, we do uh, we are aware there are challenges for other agencies and the homeowner with this um, with this you know bill, um, but the fire department is always in favor of sprinkler systems. I appreciate that. Um, I don't have, I think uh, Commissioner LaRocca has made herself quite clear as always. Uh, and Chair Cornegy, Chair Borelli, I'm gonna uh, give back the balance of my time for now. Um, and I look forward to hearing uh, from the many people who are gonna be testify testifying today about all the legislation. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from council member Rosenthal followed by council member Drum. As a reminder, council members who are making an opening, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, we'll move on to straight questioning. Um, council member Rosenthal, please go ahead. Time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not making an opening statement. I'm just going to questions. Is that all right? That's fine. Thank you. Um, my questions are actually geared toward um, the deputy commissioner from the fire department um and have to do with uh, the experience we've had um with small fires in our district um i'm wondering we've had situations where uh um, the fire people have gone into a smaller building and there are walls that are illegally put up um, so that the uh, firefighters don't really know what's in there. And I just wanted to know about your experience with that. Um, I'm gonna actually give you all three questions to answer because I think they're all related. Um, there are also a lot of times when the DOB safety plan for a building does not match the FDNY safety plan. And I'm wondering what work you do around that. Um, and then lastly, uh, my bill related to the party wall balconies, um, I complete, uh, actually is, is probably more for uh, Commissioner Laraca, but um, Deputy Commissioner, if you have any thoughts about that one, um, we'd appreciate it. The genesis of that bill is a situation when a um, building owner uh, <laughs> had to repair their stairwell and so asked, uh, sent a note around to all the residents saying that if they wanted to go in and out of the building, they had to use the fire escape. Um, which then drew our attention to the, the party balconies, which were also quite shabby. Um, anyway, so, so those are my questions, uh, Chief, thank you. Okay, so just to reiterate, to be sure, your first question is uh, in regards to uh, illegal alterations done within a building. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so when we come across this, uh, we, um, we, our process is to, is, is to notify the Department of Buildings. Um, we also take into consideration the impact of the alteration and if it poses a risk to the occupants, um, such as egress, or, um, or usually it would be an egress issue. And if that's the case, we, um, we have a process uh, internal, which is to actually vacate the, um. the area. 
but um, you know, but these are what we call referrals because it is the Department of Building, uh, you know, function to to look into illegal alterations and uh, and and you know matters like that. But we do take immediate action if there is a life life hazard, a safety hazard. Um, can I just real quickly, chairs, may I have a little bit more time so the uh, FDNY can answer these questions? Well, then Rosenthal, this is a recurring theme with you. I feel like uh, I'm, uh, I'm the principal, you're in the principal's office. I guess, I hope we're not setting a, a terrible precedent here. All right, I, I will actually keep it very short. I'm just wondering, even it, to the point you just made, um, Chief, if... Uh, you have a if you have a sense of how many times that happens over the course of a year. Um, unfortunately, I do not have that. You know, at my, uh, you know, okay. right now. We can move on. That's we, fine. You know, we'll be willing to work with you on that. And then, similarly, with the difference between the safety plans between DOB and FDNY. So on that, I'm not exactly sure. I would need a um, an ex I might need an example. Um, as to where that occurs, I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not aware of that. I guess in some ways it's similar to the first question. It's when you would show up at a site, you have the building on your, on your board based on, you know, your building plans that you have on record, and then should there be illegal walls, um, you run into that problem. Yes, and and that the process would be as I described. Okay. In the earlier question. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we're going to be hearing by Council Member Drum, followed by Council Member Rodriguez. Time starts now. Thank, thank you me. very much, Chair Cornegy and Chair Borelli. I'm going to make a statement first and then uh, another uh, statement. Uh, we need more time. That's the plea I hear from buildings, particularly co ops in my district when confronted with the city's gas line inspection deadline in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. In 2016, faced with the recent memory of two explosive tragedies in aging gas infrastructure citywide, this council passed legislation that was then enacted as Local Law 152. Our goal whenever we pass legislation aimed at promoting building safety is to get individuals and entities to comply. Gas lines are such an important issue that we have to do everything we can to facilitate compliance. With Local Law 152, co-ops and other residential buildings in my district and throughout the city are left scrambling at a time when we are all dealing with an added pandemic-induced pandemic challenge. Gas line inspections and especially remediation can entail a whole host of concerns from a hefty but critical financial investment to the displacement of residents. For this initial round of inspections, extending the deadline for six months is quite reasonable. Intro 2151A also includes measures to solicit public comment and implement education and outreach. I appreciate your, Chair Cornegie and his work, for, me, uh, his work for his work with me to ensure that these items were included in the current legislation. And I just wanna say it is good to see our commissioner, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, who I have not seen in this role. I'm more familiar with you in your previous role with the School Construction Authority. And I appreciate your support of the legislation. Um, and, um, and just wanna remind you that the deadline for community districts one, three, and 10 are coming up at the end of December. So it's my hope that we can work together quickly to pass this legislation before that deadline um, occurs. And again, thank you, Chair Cornegie, for your input into the legislation and Chair Borelli for giving me time to speak today as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, Chair Drum, I wanna let you know that whatever is necessary for us to get this passed before the deadline, uh, you can count on me and this committee to work with you to get it done. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Cornegie. Next up, we'll be hearing from Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Chen. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs. Today, I would like to talk about Intro 312, uh, which I'm a prime sponsor alongside Council Member uh, Brennan. 
which will amend the New York City fire code in relation to requiring portable fire, fire extinguish, extinguisher in all multiple dwellings. We know that everyone is going through a tough financial situation, but we need to invest to save lives. Recently, we lost two lives in my district in the Bridges building in a fire. I believe that the city should work with the private sector to help install this fire extinguisher if necessary. But our priority has to be the safety of New Yorkers, especially during this upcoming colder month. In the month of November, along with some multiple fires occur in residential buildings in Northern Manhattan and Marbury Hill. Some of these buildings did not have portable fire extinguisher ready and quickly available for residents to use. 260 Audubon was one of those where two individuals lost their life. The last fire happened two days ago, three days ago in Marbury Hill. We don't know what would have happened if this bill would have been in place, which will require portable fire extinguisher to be installed in a common area on every floor with it, at least one dwelling unit. I would like to, first of all, I mean, I would like to end thanking the men and women in the fire department for the great job that they do every day when they put their life in risk to save others. And I would like to hear from the fire department saying, what is your stand on this bill? Okay, um, well, first of all, sorry, sorry about the uh, residents of your you know, community. Um, we, we did respond to that fire and we're all aware of it, you know, the uh, last, in the last few days. But as far as portable fire extinguishers in the common area of a multiple dwelling, um, we feel we, we, we don't support that. Um, it seems counterintuitive, but the fact is that um, to operate a fire extinguisher requires, although it's not complicated, a little bit of training. There's many um, components um, that have to be taken into consideration if somebody was to use a portable fire extinguisher. I mean, one of the um, one of our most important messages to residents is when there's a fire to to leave the apartment or the dwelling, close the door, and and dial 911. We feel that is the best course of action. Um, if if there was a fire extinguisher, our fear is that the person would open the door. Uh, to their apartment, go into the hallway. I don't know how many feet away the fire extinguisher is. Once they open the door, there, there is an inrush of air that feeds the fire. So all the time what that's going on, the fire could be uh, growing exponentially. And, and the person who uh, takes the fire extinguisher may not be familiar with its use and, and, and when its use would even be detrimental in the hands of uh, a firefighter because a fire extinguisher is designed for a small fire. Now, if this fire started to expand and you attempt to use a fire extinguisher, it's, it's actually a dangerous operation. Um, there is also different types of fire extinguishers and that are designed to be used for different materials that are on fire. Uh, regular combustibles require water um, flammable liquids require um, a dry chemical or foam, and electrical fires even require uh, a specific type of fire extinguisher. Um, so I think that that's the reason why we don't think that this is um, we don't really we don't support this 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 bill. Okay. I just hope that we can continue having conversation. I think that even though we look at a pilot project. Uh, to see how we work in a particular area. I think that unless we, and, and, I, and I do respect your knowledge and, and as, as a department that we rely on to keep us safe when it comes to fire. But I feel that I understand your, your knowledge about this, but I also feel that we have not have it yet. So we don't know what the result is. And, and I do believe that if we have to look at any pilot project to see how it works. Uh, here in my district on 96 Island um, Street, we lost, you know, one of my neighbors a few years ago who used to run the larger dog runner here in Manhattan. 
And I think that if we will be a fire extinguisher there, his life could be safe. And of course, this is assumption based on what I, we know. We will rely on you for your knowledge. I, but I think that we, if we can look at the possibility, even if we can do a pilot project, I, I hope that we can have conversation about it. Uh, yes, we are always open to, you know, further discussion for, you know, to uh, make uh, fire safety, uh, you know, improve fire safety in any situation. Um, one thing very important also to emphasize is that uh, that members, uh, have, that people have working smoke detectors um, and how important it is to change the batteries two times a year, usually when you change your clocks back uh, the two times during the year, it's a good time to change the battery in your smoke detector. And that will save lives because when the smoke detector also notifies you in a very early stages of a fire where you still have a chance to get out safely and always close the door. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. And next, we're going to be hearing from Council Member Chen, who will be asking a question, followed by Council Member Rosenthal, who will be asking a second round of questions. Thank you. Time starts now. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the chairs. Um, I wanted to talk about 1146A. And I just heard from the, uh, um, the fire chief, and I agree with you that we need to do more on uh, education on fire safety. In my district, I have a lot of, uh, you know, old uh, tenement building, and we had some tragic fires uh, since I've been, you know, in the city council, and that is a concern that I have, and that's why I signed on to as a co-sponsor for the sprinkler bill because that's why automatically you think that the sprinkler system will be the best. If there's a fire, you know, the water comes down and, and, and it would um, put out the fire. And I was, um, I also want to thank a lot of my uh, constituents who are small property owner who have reached out uh, in the last couple of days about their concern uh, of the cost factor, the invasiveness, and also issues that we haven't thought about. I chair the Committee on Aging. A lot of the residents are seniors, and I just can't imagine uh, seeing them having to be relocated in order for the sprinkler system uh, to be installed. And I think the commissioner uh, LaRocca talked about that. And so I think that what can we do uh, with property owners and owners to really improve, uh, you know, fire safety uh, education? Let's see if there's a way that we can work together. Because some seniors don't know how to change the battery uh, on their alarm. So I mean, if we can work together with the owner to really do that for the resident, uh, that might be helpful. I think fire safety is a big concern. Uh, so, you no, know, we're really ready to work with, with everyone uh, on that. And uh, I guess the uh, deputy, uh, the assistant chief, I mean, how can the fire department really work with us to work with landlords to do more of this regular inspections and, and safety education uh, so that we can prevent tragedy from happening? Uh, well, the fire department is a, a big proponent of fire safety and you did touch upon the working smoke detectors and that would be the number one, um, you know, fail safe or, you know, you know, fire safety measure that could be taken uh, by, by a, a building owner to make sure that all of the apartments uh, have working smoke detectors and also the individual um, apartment uh, owner or renter. Um, so that is key. That is one of the main components of that. And also time expired. always maintaining a, a means of egress, and making sure that you have access to, you know, uh, your fire escape or whatever it may be. So that in conjunction with the smoke detectors is a bet, you know, is a great fire safety lesson that, um, that you know, the fire department uh, is, is always, you know, in reinforcing. I think because of all the, uh, a lot of the unanswered questions 
to 1146B and all the concern that's being raised right now that, that I haven't heard about. And they are a really important issue. Um, I am gonna get off the bill. Uh, I'm withdrawing my support right now for 1146, uh, but I still wanna make sure that we work with uh, you know, property owners, small building owner uh, to ensure uh, fire safety. And if there's ways that we can develop a program to do that, I look forward to working with the fire department and the small property owner. Thank you. Okay, I do have also from the fire department is Julian Basil, our, our account, FBNY Council. I, I, if we have a minute, I, I would pass it on to him if he has anything to say about this question. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, yes, thank you. Um, uh, council member, I, I, I do want to emphasize that in recent years, the fire department has um, really uh, enhanced and expanded the public information about emergency preparedness and fire safety in apartment buildings. Uh, we put out an expanded emergency preparedness guide and um, pursuant to uh, a recent local law, we have an evacuation checklist. And, and there, HPD has also joined us on the uh, landlord side in terms of encouraging building owners to talk to uh, apartment residents about emergency preparedness. This isn't just about fire safety, it's also about weather emergencies and all kinds of other conditions that might affect the building, loss of power, um, things of that sort. So we have been trying to uh, encourage building owners to talk to apartment residents and have a discussion about what can be done by the building owner and what can't be done by the building owner, What residents themselves should be preparing for in the event of various kinds of fire safety or other emergencies. Uh, from a fire safety perspective, as the chief explained, you know, the key is usually the, uh, the smoke detector in the absence of a sprinkler system. The, the smoke detector is the key thing that they need to maintain. And we, the fire department also has a fire safety education unit that does a lot of outreach activity with seniors and other community groups about um, helping them uh, either get or install um, um, fire safety directors, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, uh, fire alarms and or um, maintaining them. And so we, we do have a fairly active program to promote this, but you know, it is a big city and there are a lot of people in it and not everyone is paying attention um, to this particular issue. Now we appreciate all the great work that the fire department has been doing. I think hopefully with this discussion because of this bill that we can encourage uh, property owners to really work together with FDNY uh, to really promote uh, safety, fire safety emergency um, in every building, uh, especially these older buildings in our district. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Now we'll be calling on council member Rosenthal for a question. If any other council members have a question, please raise your hand or else after this, we'll be moving on to the public testimony. Uh, wait, before we go to uh, uh, council member Rosenthal, I just wanted to acknowledge the presence of council member Powers. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, you know, I heard commissioner LaRocca state in her testimony that my bill about the party or whatever terraces would significantly burden DOB's inspection budget. And I respect that totally. If we could just put a pin in that for one second, can you speak to any problems that DOB inspectors have encountered with, the, um, with these terraces or small balconies? And uh, in general, I would love feedback from both the fire department and uh, Department of Buildings on this bill. Certainly. Um, so putting a pin in, in staffing considerations, um, certainly welcome the opportunity to talk more about uh, what drove the bill, although you, you uh, alluded to it in your previous question, council member. Um, from our perspective, um, you know, I, to your point about whether inspectors uh, from the department have raised concerns, I have not heard, um, but again, you know, we have uh, property owners who already have an established requirement to maintain their building, which includes any um, uh, fixtures on the exterior of a building, uh, such as a fire escape. Um, um, 
as well as the heightened um, uh, workload for our buildings that are six stories or greater, um, where obviously local law 11 applies. So um, from our mind's eye, uh, certainly any opportunity to talk to the council about ways we can improve um, the maintenance and safety of a building is one we would uh, value. So I certainly would value that conversation. Thank you. If there are no more questions, um, we would now be moving on to public testimony. Um, as a reminder, um, unlike in in-person hearings where we call on a panel, we'll be calling on individuals on a one-by-one -one basis. Once, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set a timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to three people. Three minutes, I'm sorry. Um, today, first, we're gonna be hearing from Joseph Condon, followed by Barika Williams, Albert Stott, uh, Scott, and Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, committee members, uh, committee chairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Joseph Condon. This testimony is provided on behalf of the Community Housing Improvement Program, uh, which is an organization representing uh, thousands of small and medium-sized rent-stabilized housing providers uh, throughout New York City. We are focusing the testimony on intro 1146B because it has the most severe impact on uh, housing providers and their residents uh, of all the bills being considered today. We do understand that safety is the number one priority here, um, and we do agree with that goal. However, we do have some concerns with the lack of tools available uh, right now uh, to deal with the real life circumstances that will be forced upon owners and their ten tenants because of 1146B. In particular, um, the, the bill would turn buildings into construction sites. It would disrupt tenant lives for months, uh, potentially requiring relocation of tenants and their families during that time. Uh, there are also other concerns. Uh, cost of compliance is a major concern. Logistics of accessing tenant apartments is a major concern, uh, especially if there are collier conditions or other types of conditions already existing in the apartment. Uh, and of course, just accomplishing the building-wide installation within the time frame, And on top of all that, this bill is being contemplated uh, during an economic recession, uh, the depths of which are still unknown. Um, but just as an example of the disruption, uh, you can look at the difficulties associated with the similar situation that occurs when having to install or repipe cooking gas lines throughout a building. In that situation, each apartment must be repiped just like would be required under 1146B. Um, in those situations, you know, six months is, uh, is, a, normal is a normal time frame. Um, I just wanna say thank you to the committee for considering uh, comments and um, we would be happy to work on the details of 1146B to uh, limit disruption and dislocation of tenants uh, and address all the logistical concerns as well as the cost concerns. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for your testimony and being clear and concise uh, with it. I think if everybody can, can do that, we can hear from uh, the amount of people who have signed up to testify, which is a large number. So uh, I, I think you've set a fairly decent precedent outside of going over just a little bit of, of how the testimony can be received uh, in a way that's very productive for us to make a determination on continuing or not continuing with this bill. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Marika Williams, followed by Anne Heaney Korchak, um, followed by Tanya Friedberg. Time starts now. Um, and Co Chair Cornegie, I'll try to keep it brief, so I'll I'll, I'll skip some of the pieces. Um, I just want to thank uh, the committees for for having me here. My name is Marika Williams. I'm the wait, executive. Wait, 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 Marika, we could we could barely hear you. I'm sorry. You can't hear me. Okay. Is this any better? Better. Yeah, much okay. better. Please start our time over. Please start our time over. That was my fault. No, no worries. Um, I, my name is Barika Williams. I'm the executive director of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. And I want to say thank you to Chair Cornegie, to Chair Borelli, and the members of the committee for having me here today to speak. 
Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of both ANHD and for our 80 plus neighborhood based affordable housing and equ equitable economic development organizations that we serve across New York City. Um, and to hop right to the point, um, I'm specifically similarly speaking about the impact of intro um, 1146B. Um, uh, we understand similar to the previous uh, uh, testimony that the priority here is, is safety and security of tenants and residents um, and very much understand and support that intent, uh, but have serious concerns about the proposed uh, bills impact to specifically small homeowners, affordable housing stock, um, public housing, and generally uh, the potential impact, the, the disparate impact for communities of color and immigrant communities. Um, so specifically want to speak to the cost of affordable to affordable housing developers. So this is obviously the installation of sprinklers would potentially add a huge cost to eligible buildings. Um, it doesn't, the bill doesn't address how those costs would be absorbed by affordable housing developers, which operate within the confines of government subsidy and government support. Um, uh, normally and traditionally, uh, our members come back to folks like the city, like HPD, in order to make large scale infrastructure improvements and investments. Um, and there are a number of programs, for example, the Green Housing Preservation Program that are set up to be able to do uh, these kind of infrastructure investments. And so absent some sort of capital pool of funds, it's not clear how affordable housing um, projects um, and developments would be able to absorb and handle these costs. Um, this is prior to, uh, but only exacerbated by in light of COVID where many of our buildings have I'm expired. Okay, have placed cuts of up to 20% in their rent rolls. The two other things that I'll say is um, addressing access to credit for small homeowners and recognizing that it's specifically black and brown homeowners will not have access to credit to address this the same way that it, our understanding is it is an eligible MCI expense um, and that there also is no provision or and it's not clear how NYCHA could comply with this bill. Thank you. Wait, so, so uh, Barico, on behalf of ANHD, I, I felt like you had some recommendations to get us to a place of safety that didn't include uh, what, you are, uh, what you're detailing as onerous uh, kind of, of ways of implementation. If you could just take a minute to, uh, I'm gonna ex extend you the courtesy, I know you have a recommendation. Yeah, so, at, at least at least one recommendation. So I think our, our recommendation and, and uh, would be that that any sort of um, uh, mandate around sprinklers would need to be paired with a, a pool of capital funds, both for small homeowners and small landlords who don't have the same access to credit, especially understanding that we know that this is going to hit black and brown homeowners, immigrant homeowners, and black and brown small businesses, which are small landlords, um, who are not gonna be able to access those funds, uh, let alone be able to afford it, but then likely not get the same um, uh, credit access and recognition from, from banks and lenders. Um, and then a, a pool of money as well for, for affordable housing um, uh, landlords and, and property managers uh, so that they can then go and access a zero interest pool of funds to be able to make any uh, modifications that are proposed. So we, we've just got to understand that the expectation that affordable housing projects are able to make any of these improvements without a pool of, of funds to, to support the implementation uh, is, is un highly unlikely and unrealistic. Thank, thank you for your testimony and thank you for the recommendation. Thank you. Next up, we're going to be hearing from Anne uh, Heaney Korchak, followed by Christopher Athenos, followed by Jan Lee. Time starts now. Anne, you're on mute. I apologize. Sorry. Um, I'm a landlord to 20 tenants on the Upper West Side in District 6. Um, I spoke to an engineer about installing sprinklers in each of our apartments, and he said it could cost me $20,000 per unit to do this work. Uh, the COVID crisis has exhausted all of our resources, and we simply cannot afford to do, you know, work of this scope. Um, but small building owners like myself, you know, have lots of questions. Um, firstly, uh, does DEP agree that we have the infrastructure to support sprinkler systems to all of these buildings? 
Are there enough licensed and qualified contractors to do this work in New York City? Does the DOB have enough staff to do the inspections in a timely manner? Will landmarks allow me to install a water tank on my roof? Will APS be responsible for dealing with the tenant who has not left her apartment in 20 years and won't give us access to do this installation? Much of New York City's housing stock is old. Retrofitting the 120 year old building that my family owns is near impossible to implement while the building is occupied. I offer this solution for fire safety. Let's increase the funding to the FDNY budget so that they have enough personnel, enough firehouses and enough equipment to quickly respond to all of our calls. They are our greatest resource in protecting people and property. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for your testimony. As, as it was said earlier, we're going to hear from stakeholders from the entire city of New York, whether it's homeowners, fire safety, um, uh, experts, uh, uh, advocates. And I, I think it's important to hear every single person's voice and not to mute that voice. And that's what these hearings are about. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we'll be hearing from um, Christopher Athenos, followed by Jan Lee, followed by Hal Dorfman. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Christopher Athenaeus. I'm a small property owner from Brooklyn. And um, you know, I'm here to uh, emphasize that uh, and oppose 1146B because um, you know our, our buildings, I have a building that's built in 1850. There would be no way uh, for us to feasibly um, and physically uh, inst make such an installation. It's just impossible. I mean, we have a, it's a landmark building inside. Um, we have very ornate, you know, landmark plaster moldings that uh, it would create such disruption to the tenants. I mean, it, it's not even a matter, I mean, cost is like astronomical, but even if you gave me the money to do it, we still would not be able to do it. It's not a matter of, um, you know, of course it's a matter of money, but it's not even for me, even if you gave it to me, we still would not be able to do it. I mean, I'm not being sarcastic, but I mean, you might as well just knock the building down and build up a new building. And, and for new construction, I can clearly see the need and, and the requirement to put in new, to put in sprinklers. I mean, it makes sense. When we build new buildings, we make them energy efficient. We make them um, safer than the buildings that were built so many years ago. But, um, you know, from just telling you from someone who has his boots on the ground, it's just not feasible. Um, I have building a, a larger building, 30 units that has solar panels on the roof. I talked to a plumber. He said you would need a water tank on the roof. My roof is full of solar panels. I don't know how I would put structurally. I don't think uh, it would support additional weight, not to mention if we put a big tank on my roof, I wouldn't have any sun to save energy. Um, uh, you know, I just think that you have to consider uh, increasing the fire department budget. I know everyone likes to cut cut budgets when times are tough. Uh, years ago, they cut the fire department budget, and when you reduce response times, that has an effect on fires. I mean, I think um, the the best way to fight a fire is to have the experienced men and women of the time expired. Um, and and I and I hope you consider expanding the fire department's budget. Thank you. Uh, Chris, just for the record, uh, no one wants to cut the budgets of our first responders. Nobody likes to do that. I know, but someone has to, someone, they've done it before. I'm not saying uh, this, maybe not this committee, but. Um, uh, no, 100%. And I just had uh, both you and Ann, how many units in your buildings? Um, I, I have, uh, my family owns and operates nine buildings, about 145 units um, in Brooklyn. What is, what's the, what's the smaller uh, height density of, of one of your smaller units? I have uh, buildings as small as three units and uh, buildings that are six stories uh, high. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Ann? Uh, yeah, we have two um, five-story brownstones on the Upper West Side. So um, they have 10 units in each building. Um, so they would each exceed that, you know, 40 foot um, threshold that you've set in the bill. Right, so I, I'm just asking so that we as a, as a you know, as a people that are listening can, can actually get a picture of what, what these units look like. Yeah. And, right. and and what kind of density we're talking about, right? Yeah. So so I'm not to put you on the spot, but just so we can. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, Most of them are brownstones. The highest one for me is the six-story building. And I apologize if I sound a little like fire in my voice or fire in my belly, but um, you know, uh, I'm just speaking from the heart. No, thank you, Christopher, for your testimony. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from Jan Lee, followed by uh, Hal Dorfman, followed by Peter Varsalonen. Time uh, starts thank now. Thank you to both of the chairs. Um, Chair Borelli, you hit so many high points on this and, and so glad that you are hitting those high points because it's the same questions that we have. And I want to thank Council Member Chin for having thank an you. ear, listening to the people in her district, particularly small property owners and, and certainly our seniors. It's so important. I am a third generation property owner. We have owned two tenement buildings in Chinatown for going on 96 years. We have provided excellent service to our low income, 100% rent stabilized tenants. And it is through that lens I want to express to you, it is the spirit of your 1146B is great. We all want to preserve life. We all want to extend the lives of our tenants and make sure that they are comfortable and safe as we have done for 96 years. So it makes sense to ask us first, and it's disappointed that since 2018, small property owners haven't been consulted about this in any organized way. With that said, relocation stress syndrome is a real thing. And I urge the council to really look into relocation stress syndrome and how that actually can diminish and kill many more people than what your bill is designed to do. What it purports to do is preserve life. If we turn our tenants' lives upside down as they're trying to get their lives back on track as we emerge from COVID-19, it is simply not fair. And I'm insulted that, that the only thing that um, the Chair Garage could say is maybe we can give you a loan. We don't want more loans. We are in debt. You don't understand. We cannot be thrust further into debt as we emerge from COVID-19, and many of us don't qualify for loans. So please don't insult us by saying that the best you can do is give us loans. So with that said, just like Christopher, you can hear in my voice, I have fire in my voice because we absolutely cannot bear the responsibility. Don't take a fire hose approach to something that really should be done with surgical, with surgical precision. We cannot drop this, this bomb on, on all of New York City, try, expecting everybody to recover healthily with bills like this. So please reconsider and please withdraw this bill permanently. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen, for your uh, testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Hal Dorfman, followed, followed by Peter Barcelonin, followed by Kate Elvin Yale. Time starts now. Yes, my name is Hal Dorfman. I am a registered architect and it's my duty to implement the laws that the city council passes. I would like to say that to save a life is to save a world, but this bill 1146B is designed not to do that. It's designed with the most lowest amount of deaths as reported by Chief uh, Hogan of 64 in 2019, we're at the safest point in our history in terms of fire safety. We have the most professional, the most professional full-time fire department of any city in the country. Our buildings are designed to be safe from the 38 code, the 68 code, and now with the 2008 code, requiring all buildings except one and two family houses to be fully sprinklered. We have laws that have just been implemented in 2018, local law 113, which requires all new photoelectric smoke detectors be installed. These smoke detectors can last from seven to 10 years and have proven to provide the most safety for people to alert them. The other thing I must say is that as a person who has to read these laws that are implemented, it's important to create an education campaign for not just architects, engineers, but everyone, all the people, all the tenants need to know what their responsibility is. You make us put cards on the inside of apartments. Also, I am a landlord of a 43 foot high building with eight tenants that has fire rated doors and 12 inch masonry walls in the hallway. It is a safe building has existed for over a hundred years and nobody has died in that building. I thank you very much, but I believe that intro um, 1146 should be tabled and, and should not continue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Dorfman. And thank you for your expert testimony. We, we hope to hear from architects 
uh, today. So thank you for chiming in. If you ever need me to participate in a committee, I have participated as an industry advisory representative to the New York City Department of Buildings for the last 33 years. And I'm a past president of the New York Society of Architects. And my society wrote the code since 1916 before they were digitized and taken over by the building department and now the IBC. So I'm only happy to participate in committees of the city council. I, I'm available anytime. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Buffman. Somebody from my office will reach out so we can be in contact. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Peter of Barcelona, followed by Kate uh, Elvin Yale, followed by Avi G. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Peter Barcelona. I'm a New York State licensed professional engineer and principal of Rand Engineering and Architecture. I'm also serve on the board of Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums. I'm speaking today to voice opposition to intro number 1146B. For all unit owners, the disruptive impact to the interior of their apartments would just be overwhelming. Ceilings would need to be open to permit installation of new sprinkler piping and heads, and drop ceilings would need to be added where none exist. Ceiling lights, fans, plumbing system, piping, and mechanical vents would need to be relocated or removed in connection with this work. Residents may even need to vacate their apartments depending on the extent of these alterations. In addition, a new sprinkler system would require extensive infrastructure improvements. The construction requirements for high-rise residential buildings, those are greater than 125 feet, are frankly staggering. A dedicated fire or combined service would be needed in buildings, along with new backflow prevention and metering equipment. The water storage tanks atop older residential buildings are just too small and usually only have a 3,500-gallon fire standpipe reserve. Those would need to be replaced with 15,000 gallon tanks or higher. The steel supports for those tanks are inadequate and needs, would need to be uh, enlarged or, or supplemented. Many buildings require sprinkler booster pumps to increase pressure. Others require fire alarm. All sprinkler system upgrades require fire alarm notification. So the fire alarm system in the building, if one even exists, would have to be upgraded or otherwise installed. Um, there's also large uh, electrical requirements for fire pumps and some actually require emergency power generation. Although the installation of sprinklers throughout all residential buildings is well-intentioned, the use of sprinklers should not be seen as a fail-safe for preventing civilian deaths, injury, or damage that can occur in a fire, which are already at historic lows. You know, the use of fire-rated construction, the prevalence and effectiveness of smoke and alarm detection devices, rapid fire de uh, department response times, the adoption of the 20, uh, 2008 code, as Hal mentioned, all those have really helped to keep these numbers low. For these reasons, I, we ask I'm that to strongly reconsider the bill in its entirety. And thank you very much for allowing me to express this viewpoint. So, so Mr. Barcelona, I mean, Bar, Bar Barcelona, yes, Barcelona. Um, <laughs> you gave a litany of things that would have to happen for effectively to add a sprinkler system. You got a price tag for that? This is clearly in the upper six figures for most buildings that are considered high rise. For lower rise buildings, meaning ones that are six stories or less, you're looking at probably about a half a million dollars, depending on, let's say, up to about 40 to 50,000 square feet. Um, so it's a significant cost investment beside all the, th the things that everyone talked about in terms of disruption. We just can't find a real practical way to do this without requiring most tenants to leave their apartments. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to be hearing from um, Avi, um, Avi G, followed by Lyric Thompson, followed by Christopher Wadello. Time starts now. Not sure Abby's on. Okay, sorry about that. Next, we're going to hear from Kate Elvin Yale, followed by Avi G, followed by uh, Lyric Thompson. Time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Um, we oppose intro 1146B because the expense and disruption of this bill 
would cause are not, it's not in the best interest of our tenants. We've owned our building for 35 years. We know everybody who lives there. And um, as Councilwoman Chen and the fire department said earlier, tenant education is key. We inspect our apartments with our tenants when they take occupancy and every single year. We make sure they know doors have to be closed. We make sure that they know the batteries need to be in their smoke detectors. We go over the information on the back of the door to make sure they understand how to leave the building. We look at the fire escape with them and make sure there's no bars on the windows. <clears throat> we don't allow smoking in the building and we don't allow candles in the building. When we see overloaded sockets, we work with the tenant to upgrade the wiring and to uh, put in circuit breakers where, where there were none before. Um, we have batteries, battery lights in the hallways to make sure uh, if, if a system goes out or there's a fire or it's night, people can find their way out because they're supported by the batteries. The stairways are metal. There's multiple exit points for our 21 tenants. Uh, they can easily walk over our roof to the neighboring roofs. The fire department has easy access to our 50 foot tall building. The proposed sprinkler bill would cost us $500,000. That's more than our annual rent roll. And it would necessitate cutting back on many of the services we try to provide our tenants. In particular, we would have to get rid of our super, who is there on site every single day to make, every, make sure everything is running smoothly and properly, that the stairs are clear, that there's no clutter, that we know every problem that's going on to keep our tenants safe. Time expired. Okay, one last thing. Funding for the sprinklers takes, takes away from what tenants are looking for today, which is washers, dryers, dishwashers. In time of COVID, they need adequate wiring. We need to put our money into the services tenants need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Albert, for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we're going to be hearing from Avi G, followed by Lyric Thompson, followed by Christopher Widello. Time starts now. Um, I'm not Avi. I was just um, logging in to see the movie, to see the, um, to just be a part of the Zoom. Hello? You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Community oh. Council? Yeah, um, I'm just Devon Nash. I'm in a shelter right now. Um, uh, I've been in the shelter system for like three years and I have yet to get a voucher. And I'm, it's like, it costs like $6,391 um, a month. And I'm like, all I need is like $2,500 for rent. And I have like this breakdown of how much it actually costs. And I was like, can someone help me? Uh, my name is Devon Nash. My email is D-E-V-O-N-E-N-A-S-H at gmail.com. And I'm in the sh um, family shelter system with my nephew, Errol Smith. So if anyone can reach out to me and help me, it be would be very well appreciated. Thank you very much. And the sprinkler systems are a good idea because some of these old buildings, they have older people in them and they can't get downstairs really fast. And so with the sprinklers in there, it kind of like diminishes the fire because like a lot of old people court a lot of things. And so this way you can kind of like get in there and clean out the apartments and stuff like that. You know, just a suggestion. Have a great day, people. Mr. Nash, somebody from my office will be up to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Now we're going to be hearing from Avi Gross, followed by Lyric Thompson, followed by Christopher Widello. Time starts now. Are you there? Okay. Um, sorry. Next, we're going to be moving on to uh, Lyric Thompson, followed by Christopher Wadalo. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. My name is Lyric Thompson. 
Hello, Council Member Cornegie. Hello, Council Member Borelli, who's on Facebook. I'm here to speak about another aspect of fire safety, and that is fire rated egress doors. The entrance doors of multiple dwellings are supposed to be in compliance with NFPA 80. Now, HPD is the agency responsible for enforcing this standard. It's DOB standard, but HPD is responsible for enforcing it. That would be multiple dwelling 50A. Unfortunately, HPD seems to not know these standards. We had over 300 inspections on our, on our door before I realized, I realized that the door was not fire rated. HPD came out, wrote and removed violations and that defective door hardware had to be removed by the fire department before it burned our building to the ground. Now, I cannot help but think that at least one of those 300 inspectors should have noticed that this door was not up to the basic safety standard. So council member Cornegie, my question to you, sir, is are we going to wait until someone dies from this or will you take it upon yourself to call HPD and Amory Santiago into your chamber and ask why, why 300 inspections later, I'm still fighting with HPD over the standards of a fire rated door. I did not come up with these standards. They were written down in code. I could forward them to her. However, nothing seems, I mean, she just blows it off like it doesn't matter. Now, I'm lucky that the, the two tenants that caught that door malfunction notified us and then notified the fire department before somebody got hurt. I would rather somebody not have to die before this issue is addressed. So what say you, sir? I will call the commissioner, uh, but I don't actually have a chamber to call her into, but I will, I will, I will call her and make her aware that we, we, we know that as we're discussing fire safety, that there are some deficiencies in tenants. So I will do that. I sent you, I sent you four years of photos that clearly document that HPD does not know these standards. So perhaps we could also, in addition to having a conversation with Ms. Santiago, ask the commissioner of DOB, Commissioner LaRocca, if she would be willing to have a training class so that these inspectors are educated with regard to the standards they're supposed to enforce. Can we do that too? I'm sorry, yes, as safety obviously is a priority as the evidenced by this hearing, I will absolutely do that. And, and thank you Lyric for being such an advocate, not just for people in your building, but for people in the system who need advocacy. Thank you. Well, I'm trying and I'm still waiting to hear from you, by the way. Yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be reaching. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you Lyric. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Christopher Wadello, followed by Kerry Farrell, sorry, Kelly Farrell, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, followed by Laura Rothrock. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chair Carnegie. My name is Chris Wadello. I am the Director of External Affairs for the New York State Association for Affordable Housing, otherwise known as ISAFA. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity to provide the following comments on bills being heard. Uh, by the committee today. Um, we're the trade association, ISAF is a trade association for New York's affordable housing industry with nearly uh, 400 members, including developers, lenders, investors, attorneys, uh, contractors, architects, uh, all those that are active in the financing construction operation of affordable housing. While fire safety is an important priority in development, rehab and preservation work and building management, uh, intro 1146B's approach of mandating sprinkler systems in all residential buildings over 40 feet is infeasible. The costs associated with the piping, water service, and with making space for the equipment in buildings that weren't designed to include the space are astronomical. This would not be possible for not non-for-profits and small uh, owners of uh, the existing older affordable housing stock. To comply would mean we need to dig up and install infrastructure in the streets and sidewalks and burden the already very challenged uh, DEP infrastructure. The construction work at both the street level and on, in the buildings would be incredibly disruptive to tenants as well. Additionally, older buildings would more commonly uh, will more commonly have asbestos and lead challenges, which is a safety concern and additional costs uh, for remediation. As an apparently MCI eligible expense, there is also the, the potential for some of these costs to be passed through to tenants, which is inconceivable given the current environment. 
Um, finally, you know, affordable housing building owners uh, cannot bear the cost of this measure. However, uh, well intentioned this uh, legislation is, the smaller and nonprofit owners are simply trying to stay afloat during the COVID crisis, which has been devastating in terms of reduced rent rolls and increased maintenance and utility costs. The council should be focused on how to reduce the costs to providers of affordable housing and not. Time expired. Thanks uh, very much for your time and consideration. Uh, Christopher. Do you have any recommendations on behalf of NYSAFA? I would be happy to uh, send some your way if, if I can uh, send them to, to you at a later time. Happy Absolutely. To. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Kelly Farrell, uh, followed by Laura Rothrock. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Farrell, and I'm from the Rent Stabilization Association, which is a real estate group that represents 25,000 diverse owners and managers who collectively manage over 1 million units of housing in every neighborhood and community throughout the city. Um, we're here today to speak in opposition to intro 1146B, the sprinkler bill. I also want to note that we've submitted testimony on the number of other bills, most notably in support of 21. 51A, but we're going to use our time today to speak in opposition to this bill. As you've heard from a number of owners so far today, this bill would create an incredible logistical and financial burden on owners throughout the city. Obviously, there's going to be some impacts on tenants and the disruption in their, in their lives, um, the dangers, the um, exposure to the lead paint and masonry and asbestos that the, um, the work would um, inflict upon them and then potentially months long disruption um, movement going elsewhere. But um, given what's going on in the city at this time, it really is um, the precarious state of real estate. Um, this measure, the financial hardships, um, vacancies are at an all time high, rent collections at an all time low. The Housing and Stability um, Tenant Protection Act has created um, an inability to recoup any of these costs. And along with the Climate Mobilization Act also that's now requiring rent stabilized tenants um, buildings to engage in um, other costly measures. It's just, there's just no way that this is a feasible um, request um, of owners throughout the city. Um, the residential estimates and the costs are just so high that there's just no way that it's feasible for sprinkler re retrofits to be undertaken in residential situations at this time. Thank you, Ms. Farrell, for your testimony. Thank you. Um, and as a reminder, there's no need to raise your hand. We will be calling on everyone who, who is registered. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Laura Rothrock, followed by Marianne Rothman, followed by Melissa Barber. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Council Member Cornegie and members of the New York City Council. My name is Laura Rothrock and I'm providing testimony on behalf of the New York Coalition of Code Consultants, also known as NYCCC. NYCCC is a nonprofit trade organization whose member, members specialize in securing construction and development approvals from municipal agencies, as well as building code and zoning consultants. I'm testifying today in support of intro 1917, different topic than has been discussed so far, which allows for self-certification for certain work after the issuance of a work without a permit violation. We applaud Council Member Cornegie for introducing this bill to amend Local Law 158, which takes away the ability for an applicant to self-certify construction work and related documents for one year if there was a work without a permit violation issued on any part of that building. NYCCC supports the intention of Local Law 158, which was to protect residential tenants from unsafe conditions and harassment. However, the law has had un unintended consequences, which intro 1917 corrects. Self-certification is an important tool for commercial tenants and for the Department of Buildings because it allows licensed professionals to expedite the process of obtaining plan approvals without compromising safety or putting additional strain on DOB resources. This bill is particularly important for commercial tenants who are fitting out their lease spaces. Commercial tenants should not have to be penalized for violations caused by other tenants in the same building and should not have to float their businesses for an extended period of time while they await approval to fit out their spaces. In summary, intro 1917 provides a practical solution to remove unfair burdens on businesses and we hope this committee will vote in favor of the bill. We thank you for your consideration. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for your testimony and for reminding me that there were actually other bills on the agenda. <laughs> 
some some of which don't uh, uh, cause such a uh, a stir and uproar. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Mary Ann Rothman, followed by Melissa Barber. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mary Ann Rothman, uh, and I thank you for this opportunity to add my voice to the chorus in opposition to intro 1146B. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, uh, which is a membership organization uh, where more than 170,000 New York families make their homes. Uh, and our member buildings span the full economic spectrum from very modest income restricted housing to solid middle class apartment complexes and upscale dwellings. I point out that in housing co-ops and condominiums, everyone is both a tenant and a landlord. Uh, and therefore we are subject to all of the issues that have already been raised and which I will continue to raise. The COVID-19 pa pandemic has hit our members hard. People have lost their livelihoods, their loved ones, their neighbors, colleagues, workers, friends. Resources are strained, but New York property taxes have reached high records and buildings must still comply with the FIST program of facade inspection, the carbon reduc reducing mandates of local law 97, and with many more requirements of city and state. I would hope that intro 114B would not become one of those requirements. Most of the buildings affected by this legislation are non-combustible buildings and history has shown the ability of FDNY to respond quickly and to control fires within these apartments and save lives. Sprinklers are not a panacea as they can be slow and less effective against some fires. Um, our colleague Peter Barcelona has detailed for you the complexity of installing sprinklers and their astronomical costs. Mandating this tremendous capital expenditure will Time divert scarce funds and attention from the other urgent goals in our city. Please do not pass this bill. Thank you for this opportunity to express our views. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. Rothman. Could you please just um, state uh, your organization, again, for the record? It's called the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, and we are submitting written testimony uh, with comments on all of, on more of the bills. Uh, thank you. Do you have any recommendations at this time from your organization? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, ple I'm pleased with a lot of the recommendations I've heard already. Um, education is vitally important. It was a pleasure to see Julian ba Basil here. He has been a speaker at many of our conferences, helping us educate our members uh, about uh, all sorts of safety precautions. Um, uh, you'll hear from another uh, of, of my colleagues about possibly requiring um, when a kitchen renovation is done, possibly requiring a, a, a sprinkler retrofit in the kitchen that, that could be small enough to be based on the domestic water system and kitchens are the source of a tremendous percentage of fires. So that's certainly worth considering. So this is this is the reason that I'm asking um, recommendations because some of them make absolute sense and could be an alternative to the bill and it could actually cover the safety concerns that we as a council and me as a chair have, but not disproportionately negative Im negatively impact our affordable housing stock and or our small uh, building operators. So thank you for that. And and we'll be taking all of these recommendations, compiling them, and then reviewing them just for for the record. Thank, thank you. I, this has been a fascinating hearing. I thank, I thank you for how well you're running it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we'll be hearing from Melissa Barber, followed by Michael Wolf, Wolf sorry, followed by Nathan Fishman. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Melissa Barber. I wanted to thank um, everyone for the opportunity to speak today. I work with the Mechanical Contractors Association with New York City licensed fire sprinkler contractors who employ a local 638 uh, steam fitter labor. Um, I've worked for the MCA for over 20 years and I've been an advocate for fire sprinkler protection for that time. And I've seen um, the majority of fire sprinkler legislation be driven by, unfortunately, by tragedy. 
Um, the need for fire sprinklers still is clear. Last week, we had a 10-year-old boy critically injured when a fire broke out in Marble Hill. On November 22nd, two lives were lost in a building in Washington Heights. Um, and in October, a five-year-old boy died of smoke inhalation. Um, some of the reason for this is our fires grow hotter and faster than they used to. Um, flashover is within four minutes usually. And the FDNY response time, according to my last records, and I don't want to contradict you know, if, if I'm wrong, um, was approximately five minutes. The FDNY does do an amazing job. Um, we just think sprinklers would be an additional tool. And I, I want to be cognizant of everything everyone said today. I think there's really important points being made. I just like to be part, I don't think that the bill should be completely disregarded because I think there's some things that we can look at further in terms of height, type of construction of building, configurations, available water supply, um, the type of pipe, is a fire pump needed? So I just think we need to be looking at properties. We need to be looking at the code changes and um, coming together in a response that, that does make our residential apartment building safer and um, you know, is cognizant of all, you know, to develop a policy and plan that will result in a safer city. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, and, and that's kind of, if I'm not mistaken, Barry, who was the bill's original uh, prime sponsor was where the place that he came from, which was really about safety. So thank you for your perspective. And also thank you for your expert uh, uh, testimony in this case um uh, we I'd have like, heard i'd like to send you some um you know some statistics and some case studies on some retrofit around the country and in particular philadelphia um looking at the cost and the different types of buildings too if that'd be okay no that would be that would be we we would like to take in as much information as we possibly can today as the hearing chair uh in an effort to get to a place that again doesn't you know uh, put safety as a as a premium and a priority but doesn't disproportionately negatively impact Oh, the one thing I forgot to mention, and I hope everyone listening is is cognizant of, you know, to please advocate also, there are things like the Public Housing Fire Safety Act that Max Rose and Peter King, a bipartisan federal legislation that would provide grants for fire sprinkler protection. There are, there's a bill in New York State legislature for tax incentives, um, given obviously uh, the fiscal crisis we're in. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm aware of that. And, but I think there are things people should be, you know, I think there are programs and hopefully financing that we can go along with this. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Jan, I see you shaking your head vehemently. Unfortunately, this is not a forum for debate, uh, but I, I could see that <laughs> both Christopher <laughs> and Jan and Anne are ready for a spirited debate. Unfortunately, <laughs> that won't take place. Honestly, thank you all for your perspectives uh, and thank you for your expert um, opinion on this and, and expert testimony. Thank you. Um, I believe Councilmember Grzenczyk had his hand raised for a question. Yes, please, Barry. Time starts now. I'm listening intently to everybody and uh, I'm gonna wait, I think, until the end of the hearing. And I, I certainly appreciate the comments of many people, uh, some of whom I know very well some of whom I'm meeting for the first time today, but I think I'm gonna wait, Mr. Chairman, until uh, we're done uh, to talk further. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Next, we're gonna hear from Michael Wolf, followed by Nathan Fishman. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. I hope you had a nice Thanksgiving and wish to thank all council members for allowing me to present to you today. My name is Michael Wolf. I'm the president of Midborough Management, a full service management firm representing over 15,000 cooperative condominium and rental apartments in New York City for almost four decades. In addition, I'm the chair of the Real Estate Board of New York's Residential Management Council and a member of the board of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums. Prior to the pandemic, I met with council member Barry Gudenchik to discuss this very issue and appreciate his willingness to hear all sides. The primary method of fire protection during the majority of the 1900s focused on passive fire protection using fire barriers, fire rated walls, floors and ceilings that typically divide a building into areas for fire control. Therefore, we do have a system in place. Suggesting that all buildings are in one bucket is not the correct approach. The New York City Fire Department advises residents in non-combustible buildings to remain in their apartments unless the fire is in their apartment. Clearly, fire spread is not a major concern in such type of construction. 
The city also mandates smoke and carbon monoxide detectors and signage in each dwelling unit, rightfully so, alerting residents of any smoke or fire condition quickly. Most home fires begin in the kitchen. I had suggested to the councilman during our meeting that adding a sprinkler head during a kitchen renovation is a possibility if the head could be supplied through the domestic system, not requiring a new water line that would add unnecessary cost demolition and restoration. Therefore, little by little, you'd be retrofitting each kitchen and every apartment in the city. The loss of life is one too many. However, to suggest retrofitting all buildings over 40 feet tall with sprinklers is not realistic for many reasons. We would be talking about millions of dollars in a particular building, including destroying interior finishes that may not be able to be replicated. A 2029 deadline exasperates the burden of Local Law 97, the Climate Mobilization Act that added penalties for energy use that is out of the control for so many. I'm expired. The pandemic has resulted in extreme financial hardship for so many with residents leaving New York and many not returning. The suggested cost of action at 1146 would add to the extreme cost of living in New York City and reduce its appeal even further. Projected projects cost and disruption, cutting into walls and ceilings to hang pipe is always disruptive and dirty. When asbestos and lead may be involved, the hazard, work, hazard makes work much more complicated and residents will have to relocate. By New York City code, Residents are advised of safety plans and procedures. We all share the same goal of keeping our neighbors safe, but at what cost? Let us find ways to provide relief, not additional burden. Thank you all for your time, and most importantly, stay well. Uh, uh, Michael, thank you so much. Your proposal, which is the second time we heard, I think we heard it from Melissa first, she beat you to it, um, uh, of the uh, sprinklers in um, retrofitted kitchens. Um, in order to get to the place that the bill suggests that we get, how long do you think it would take? It so would take- How many it, years do you think it will? We're it, talking 10, 15, 20 years? It, it'll be m multiple decades at, at that rate. The, the, the problem is putting in a new water line, new pump system, new tank. But if there was a way to tap into an existing rise or a branch line, which is very easy during a kitchen renovation, adding a sprinkler head to a kitchen in a strategically located place, probably in the vicinity of the stove, would not be a heavy lift or a costly exercise at all. And, and, and in your proposal, ma not mandating that to be done immediately, only when there are renovations scheduled in kitchens. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you for your testimony. Um, before we call on our next panelist, I'd like to call on Council Member Grodenchik. Time starts now. I didn't raise my hand. If it was still raised, I'm sorry, but I, or it was unraised. So I'm still here, but I, 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 I like that sprinkle head idea, but I, we'll talk later. Thank you. I was going to say, I was going to say, Barry, make up your mind. Either you want in or you want out. No, doing? I'm all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Okay, next we're going to be calling on Nathan Fishman, followed by N Neil David Davidowitz, followed by Richard Flatow. Time starts now. Hi, um, my name is uh, Nathan Fishman. I'm an owner and property manager for rent stabilized apartments in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. The buildings we run are small five story walk ups and six story buildings. We manage clean properties with no housing violations and have, and have excellent relationships with our tenants. We have a vested interest in keeping fires out of our buildings. We understand that public safety is of, is, of, is of utmost importance and that fire prevention is important to protect our tenants. With that being said, I do not think the proposed sprinkler law, intro 1146B, would be a good idea. The magnitude of disruption that the project would cause to the tenants would be enormous. The job of installing large water pipes inside of my existing tenants' apartments would simply bother and infuriate my tenants. From my experience, tenants want to be left alone. They want to quietly enjoy their homes with that with good heat and proper services. The proposed sprinkler law would bring plumbers and construction contractors into their homes. The violent breaking of walls and ceilings, the dust and dirt it would create in these small areas would be terrible. This is a very dirty job. Furthermore, the exposure to lead when you break open the walls and the possible asbestos concerns would be very real. In fact, I believe that many tenants wouldn't even let us in. They never asked for this work to be done and simply do not want to be bothered. If you actually pull the tenancy, I believe they would be very much against such intrusion. They are hardworking people and families and would not appreciate the mess and major inconvenience that would be forced upon them. Air contamination and overall environmental disruption are almost required to accomplish this job. I believe that you are sacrificing both the mental and physical health of the tenants. Additionally and secondarily, the cost of such work to landlords would be larger than any other unfunded mandate ever passed by this council. 
Estimated at $20,000 per apartment, the cost of a retrofit for a 25 unit building would be half a million dollars. Small landlords can simply not, can simply not afford this type of major expense. There are, le there are other less intrusive ways to accomplish fire safety, like fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, fire blankets, and fire education. They all make much more sense. These are the type of things I have in my own home to protect my own family. I ask that you listen to my testimony and consider the tenants and the mess you will make of their homes. Again, speak to them as I do and know that they just wanna be left alone to enjoy their space and their families. Thank you. Um, uh, Nathan, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, you mentioned that this is a dirty job. You meant the job of installing sprinklers, not of being a council member, correct? <laughs> Of the, the job of, of the installation work of the sprinklers, of obviously, is a very dirty job. Yeah, just check. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Neil Davidowitz, followed by Richard Pato. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Carnegie and Borelli. I appreciate the opportunity to talk before you. My name is Neil Davidowitz, and I'm president of Orsid, New York a management firm that currently manages 170 residential buildings encompassing 17,000 apartments, the majority being New York City co-ops and condominiums. The buildings are located in all five boroughs. I also serve on the board of several co-op buildings. I'm speaking today to voice strenuous opposition to 1146B. I come to you on behalf of a multitude of my clients who have asked me to share their concern, actually their distress over this proposed bill. I represent many middle-class New Yorkers who understand the astronomical implications of 1146. New Yorkers were concerned that this bill, coupled with the dire economic situation in this city, will force the possible sale of their homes or the relocation of them outside of this city. The bill would require major structural and non-structural changes to both building infrastructure and to individual apartments. My clients will have to bear both of those costs. They will be required to pay their pro rata share of huge assessments to effectuate the building component of construction, and they'll have to bear 100% of the cost of the work in their apartments. That is beyond onerous. The fundamental question is, is this necessary to protect New Yorkers in apartment buildings and are there alternatives to this proposal? I respectfully say it is not necessary and there are alternatives. Although I respect the intent of the proposition, we need to look beyond it. The vast majority of my portfolio consists of fire rated buildings. We've installed smoke and fire. We've installed smoke and fire alarm systems, educated residents on fire prevention, and have detailed safety and evacuation protocols. In addition, we have also made or are planning infrastructure improvements to ameliorate the risk of fires. Specifically, upgrades to electrical systems, both within the buildings and apartments, have diminished the risk of fire. Legislation eliminating smoking in common areas, coupled with co-ops and condominiums that are now amending their governing documents to create completely non-smoking buildings will also diminish the significant cause of structural fires. Let us work together to continue to make our buildings safer and reduce fatalities without adding overwhelming financial and emotional burdens on our citizens. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Uh, Mr. Davinowitz, um, thank you for your testimony. Are there recommendations that you have with that many units? Um, are you hearing from tenants about safety, about fire safety and, 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 and those kinds of things? And if so, what are your recommendations? That's, that's, a, that's a very large portfolio, so, I'm wondering. Yes, Chairman, we, we, I'm, we're hearing my suggestions and I am hearing from my client base all the time. As has been said by many before me, you can't stress enough education. We have actually, and you can't commend the fire department of New York, and I can't commend them enough. We have basically held in so many buildings, they will come for free. And we have had informational meetings of unit owners and shareholders where the FDNY has articulated details about safety in apartments, safety in buildings, establishing protocols, great education. We've initiated inspection by building staff, whether it's handymen or superintendents, that can access apartments to ascertain if there are any visible dangerous conditions. 
people too many plugs in an outlet, extension cords, over kitchens that are you putting too much, you, you know, there's, there's too much amperage on, on a single outlet. That kind of inspection will get you so, will get a tremendous amount of assistance. Upgrading, we find that many fires may be electrical based. Improving the electrical system in the building and looking to improve panels. Um, those are some recommendations I have that I think can be done without the kind of economic stress that this bill would put on both the dollars and possibly the vacating of individuals from apartments. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Duvinowitz. Thank you, sir. Next, we're gonna be hearing from Richard Flateau, followed by Robert Altman, followed by Johanna Wong. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, council members and members of the public. Um, Chair Cornegy and Chair Borelli, thank you for allowing me to testify today regarding intro 1146B. Uh, my name is Richard Flateau, and I'm the chairperson of Community Board 3 Brooklyn, which encompasses the neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant and has one of the highest concentrations of late 19th and early 20th century brownstone row houses in the city. Intro 1146B requiring sprinkler systems for all residential buildings more than 40 feet in height would be quite damaging to brownstoners in my community, particularly those on fixed incomes. As such, as uh, with many others before me, I joined the chorus in opposition to this bill. Um, a Greek philosopher is credited with the phrase primum non nocere meaning first do no harm. That is the Hippocratic oath that medical doctors take and which is incorporated into their training and practice. The city council would be wise to follow that ancient advice. Uh, unfortunately, 1146B violates that dictum in many ways. I'll just, since time is so short, I'll just mention um, the exorbitant costs and the disruption. Um, in terms of costs for uh, typical property owners in, in my community, uh, numbers I'm hearing is 50 to $100,000 for a typical four-story row house, which would be subject to that uh, bill. Um, and with the disruption, both tenants and landlords, because many landlords live in those small buildings would be displaced uh, due to the construction. I'm just gonna offer a few um, recommendations. One would be to explore increasing the, increasing the minimum height from 40 to 60 feet. Um, a second would be to consider um, incentives, financial incentives, including uh, income tax credits, property tax abatements, and loan and grant programs. Um, and uh, since time's expired, I'll just mention the last one. Uh, the council should work with the federal U.S. Fire Administration to figure out ways to bring down the cost of retrofitted sprinkler systems for residential buildings. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Thank Plattel, you. the chair of uh, Community Board 3, my community board. Um, and I, I had no idea how you would possibly weave in Greek philosophy <laughs> in this instance, but you found a way to do that. So for that, you should be given credit alone. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Josh Kingsley, counsel to the fire committee. I'll be taking over for this portion of the hearing. Um, up next, we will be hearing testimony from Robert Altman, followed by Joanna Wong. Mr. Altman, you could go ahead. Time starts now. Mr. Allman, you're uh, on mute. Am I off mute now? You're good now. Good, thank you. Um, you have my written comments. I don't feel a need to go further on those uh, right now. However, there was some recommendations that came in from membership after I submitted the testimony, so I did want to include them. Uh, first, R, group R3, building should be exempt from the proposal, any of the proposals. They're all, and that consists of one and two family homes. Um, there are already particular provisions that will take care of the fire safety in those buildings that are sufficient. 
Um, so we feel believe no matter what, those one and two family homes should be excluded. Second, I would urge some caution on everybody sitting there and saying, well, when they retrofit, um, when you renovate the kitchen, that you, if you can tap into a domestic water line, um, this still is a tremendous expense. And I, I will tell you flat out right now, if you want to talk about safety, there are a number of people who will do a kitchen renovation without a permit. And that's probably just about equal to because it's so under the radar that um, that I would estimate that a high percentage uh, do not in fact go file for a permit. And I generally don't think DOB is out there uh, ticketing these one, two, you know, home family homes or if it's in a co-op or such. A lot of this work gets done without a permit. And for those who do use a permit, by forcing them to put in that sprinkler system and taking on the additional cost, they may say the hell with it. And in fact, decide not to go get a permit. And so what you have in there is that there are particular things such as gas hookups and such, which probably should get uh, done with a permit and should in fact be inspected. Time expired. That, uh, you want those to actually get reviewed because that's where you're going to have most of your problems with fire. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Altman. So I, I noticed that uh, your professional expertise extends past just being an attorney. Could you explain the other portion of your expertise? My expertise goes past being an attorney. Oh, it has Robert Altman Esquire, PLLC. Right. Uh, I'm an attorney and uh, PLLC is the professional limited liability company. So that discusses um, what my, uh, uh, that's the corporate name of the law practice. I just want to make sure that I, I'm giving you total credit for not only your uh, not, opinion, but based in some, some level of expertise. I'm only in fact uh, commenting on what my membership has told me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for representing your membership and doing a good job at it. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, thank you, everyone. Oh, oh, wait, and Mr. Oldman, you said that your testimony in uh, uh, had been submitted, though, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Cornegay. Next, we will hear testimony from Joanna Wong, followed by Jules Feynman and the HDFC Coalition. Time starts now. Thank you to everyone here for taking the time today to let me share my concerns with intro 1146B, Sprinkler Bill. My family operates a pre-war walk-up building in Lower Manhattan. Building safety is our number one concern. Inside the building on a daily basis includes myself, my loved ones, residential and commercial tenants whom we've known for decades, our own staff and vendors. No one cares more about safety than in, inside the building than my family and me. But in the 40 years of 40 plus years of operating the building, intro 1146B would be the most intrusive and most disruptive thing we would be asking our tenants to live and work through. The entire building from the basement to the roof, every floor, every room in every apartment would turn into a construction zone for several years. Not only would it turn into a construction zone, but it would be a construction zone in which residents would have to live through. If anyone has ever had a simple leak in his or her apartment, <laughs> then you have a taste of how disruptive it can be as a resident. You needed to move your schedule around to give access to the plumber. Your furniture and belongings had to be moved, assuming there was somewhere to move it to. Walls, floors, ceilings had to be opened up. No matter how hard you try to isolate and mitigate, dust travels. After the plumbing work is done, then the contractor has to come in to sheetrock, patch, and paint. Reimagine that same experience, multiply that by 100. Instead of working on one small area, imagine the scope of work requiring water lines be installed throughout the entire apartment, throughout the entire building. Virtually every wall, floor, and ceiling in the, throughout the entire building would have to be opened up and then restored. This is what intro 1146B is asking all New Yorkers, New Yorker residents to endure. As someone who deals with residents on a daily basis, and, the per and as the person who would be responsible for implementing this, I believe this proposal is the wrong solution. I don't want an extension of time. I don't want financing. I'm inspired. I plead with all of you to terminate this bill and explore less intrusive, less disruptive, less expensive fire prevention options. Um, I would like to end by asking the FDNY um, a question 
for their opinion because I, I truly just don't know the answer, but I wanted to know what their thoughts are on um, fire safety blankets and if they think that is an effective tool to preventing um, fires. Jo Joanna, I don't know if we still have the uh, no. FNY with us, okay. but um, I will try to field that question and um, get back to you with it. But okay. I, don't, I think they're no longer here. That's actually a great question and I, I'd like to know the answer as well. Okay, thank you. And then also, um, I've been trying to get a meeting with you too also, <laughs> uh, Chair Carnegie. So I will send a follow up, um, my, my but staff, you know, taking this opportunity to let you know. Staff is on this call, so okay. we'll make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next, we will have Jules Feynman, Feynman, apologies, followed by the HDFC Coalition. Time starts now. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I, I am a member of the HDFC Coalition, but I'm speaking as a board member of a small HDFC on the uh, border of the Upper East Side and East Harlem. Uh, we actually have sprinklers, um, but I agree with the HDFC Coalition's stance that of the thousands of uh, HDFC buildings and, and, the, and I believe 10,000s of tenants, uh, they can't afford this, okay? And especially I'm staring at this report here that says uh, there are fines of up to $10,000 a day. I don't know about this issue with, this, with the uh, kitchen upgrades, but I highly recommend the uh, education aspect. And I would urge you to speak with the fire department and possibly come up, especially during these times of COVID when you can't do face-to-face -face training, that maybe we can have some very simple, but qu simple, quick and well-produced videos that uh, you know can be distributed all across the city through YouTube or wherever. Uh, saying this is how you deal with a fire in your apartment. First of all, you don't overload your your uh, your, your apartment with extension cords. Uh, don't smoke. Don't put cigarettes in bed. Don't leave the door open if there is a fire. If you get a kitchen fire extinguisher and learn how to use it, um, all these things can be taught uh, very quickly and very easily right now. And I uh, thank you for your attention to this. And thank you for the time to speak. Oh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, jo Joanna, I'm sorry, your last name isn't showing up on the screen. Could you just give it to me, please? I'm sorry, were you speaking with me? Yeah, no. 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 Jules, I was saying thank you so much for your testimony. I was actually speaking with Joanna. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I'll be, yeah, I'll be sorry, sorry about that. I couldn't figure out how to change it. Um, last name is Wong, W-O-N-G. Okay, email address real quick. Oh, you don't want to share that publicly? I will email you, <laughs> okay, okay. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you, thank you. Okay. Sorry for uh, uh, taking this whole hearing in a different direction, Com committee council, sorry. No, no worries, sir. Um, up next, we'll have HDFC Coalition, and I believe the individual who is logged on with that, if you could identify yourself by name, um, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you, my name is John McBride. I'm with the policy committee of the HDFC Coalition, and thank you for having us. Um, I'd like to speak today briefly on two bills. Um, the first one I'd like to speak about because it, I have a shorter comment is uh, Bill 842-2018, which is just described as the luminous egress path markings. I must be frank, I haven't had time to really review the bill, but if I'm correct, this is to extend the sort of glow in the dark markings taped onto the floor in public hallways, et cetera, to indicate egress, am I correct? Does any I'll assume I'm correct um, and just keep talking and finish this quickly. Um, so I, I just wanna point out that for owners of multifamily buildings, which, which co-ops are, um, having to maintain these on the floor uh, without them getting you know, ripped off from constant mopping and people walking on the, in the hallways, et cetera, is going to be a real struggle, let alone the cost of doing it initially. And HPD will seek to, uh, or perhaps DOB, I'm not sure, will seek to issue fines for these and these, will, and these fines will cause problems for the buildings. So I think it would be helpful if this is something that the council is interested in doing to find out if we could perhaps um, put those markings on the baseboards sideways instead of directly on the floor. So they'd be less likely to be uh, ripped off the floors and then the building would be less likely to be fined. I'd now like to speak about uh, Bill 1146B. Um, I'd like to point out that there are over 1,300 HDFC co-ops in New York City, housing over 30,000 apartments, which, um, which, them, which and the apartments themselves house approximately 90 to 100,000 
um, New Yorkers. HGFC shareholders are proud homeowners of modest means. HGFC co-ops were created within buildings that were in such poor physical shape that they were abandoned by slumlords in the 1970s and 80s. I'm expired. The average uh, age of HGFC buildings is probably 100 years old. We are still struggling to repair these buildings due to neglect from decades ago. I have just a very couple more comments. We are now faced with new expense requirements such as Local Law 11 or FISP, which is Facade Inspection Safety Program. I was informed by an architect this week that simply filing the paperwork to comply costs $6,000 just for filing. And we are getting phone calls and emails from HDFC boards that cannot afford to pay the DOB fines and don't know what to do. So the problem in, in general, this is a problem that spans other requirements that the city seems to come up with from time to time, that HGFCs are affordable housing. If HGFCs don't comply with the law because they can't afford to, the city will then say that the HGFC is neglecting to keep the building safe and perhaps fine it and put it on a track to be taken over by the city. If the HGFC accepts government aid, that aid is usually funneled through HPD, which is now requiring HGFCs to essentially sign over control of the co-op through extremely onerous new regulatory agreements. So if we don't comply, we end up with fines leading to eventual foreclosure. If we do accept help, HPD requires us to, in many ways, give up control of our homes. Neither scenario is, is acceptable. So those are my comments. Thank you. Mr. McBride, thank you. And um, it is always a pleasure to work with the HBFC coalition. Um, do you have any recommendations on behalf of the coalition at this time? Well, I do want to say that this is no joke. Fire safety is a real issue. And I understand why the council is looking at this. I just think that this is just trying to throw a sledgehammer at, at a very delicate situation. The, this would bankrupt uh, buildings that are not affordable housing. So think of, think, of, think of what it would do to affordable housing. And I think it's a fascinating issue. I think the city should look at it. I think we should do studies and I think we should find out if there's something else that we can do, maybe with a different tech, a totally different technology or technologies that would really help save lives without threatening the actual viability of these, of, of housing. And I think one of the issues that's been brought up by some of the other um, commenters or, or people testifying is how do you do this in the first place, let alone the money? If you're knocking holes in people's walls and you're throwing lead dusts into their homes, if you're throwing potential asbestos into their homes, how do you deal with that? Who's going to pay for that? And how, how, where do these people go? Where are they going to go? And then the, the, these buildings themselves may not be structurally strong enough to support a big water tank on the roof to hold the water for the sprinkler system. So it's a this is a real it's really good to focus on fire safety. We uh, HDFC people in HDFCs don't want to burn alive more than any I mean any more any less than anyone else. But if we can find a way to do it that's easier and more affordable and doesn't threaten the very housing we're trying to preserve, I think that would be a really uh, laudable goal. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. McBride. Um, I'm being prompted to try to move a little bit more quickly because we have a whole host of people who would like to speak and who have waited patiently. Thank so um, while I want to intently listen to every recommendation, I'm being prompted that we'll be here all night if I continue in this way. So thank you all who waited patiently. Um, I think one of the things though, Mr. McBride, you brought up that's, that's important is us looking at new technologies and the implementation of new technologies to get us where we need to be in terms of safety. Um, I'm gonna give my daughter, my oldest daughter full credit who always tells me, daddy, you gotta skate to where the puck is gonna be, right? <laughs> so I think in this, this may be an instance that we need to be looking at skating to where the puck is actually going to be. So thank you for bringing up the technology portion of this because we are moving leaps and bounds as it relates to technology. In this committee alone, we've heard uh, hearings on drones, which we never heard, thought we'd hear before, right. in terms of safety and safety mechanisms. So. Um, that's something I certainly would like to explore on behalf of the committee and on behalf of these, these this suite of bills. Thank if, you. If, if I could just throw a plug in, a, uh, HGFCs are suffering under the FISP fines. And so just something to think about for another bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McBride. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Carnegie. Um, next, we will hear from George Vassalino, followed by April McIver. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is George Vassalino, and I represent the Master Plumbers Council. 
I'm here today to give testimony on comments and to intro to 2151. In 2016, we were privileged to work with council staff to provide technical expertise and help negotiate the final bill. We're fully supportive of the council's proposal to extend the deadlines for inspections. The inspection process has gotten off to a slow start, due in some part to some ambiguities in the law and rule. I believe we would all agree that the intent of this law is to provide the minimum standards to safeguard the public. It would be beneficial if the council would provide clarification of these issues by making a few revisions to be included in this intro. The inspection scope must be clear to everyone involved in the process and the persons conducting these inspections must possess the best available qualifications. In our written testimony, we have proposed changes to five sections of the law. I cannot fully discuss each change within my allotted time. However, the Master Plumbers Council is always available to provide further assistance if the council deems it necessary. I would li I'd like to briefly discuss the major issue that is affecting compliance today. As of today, the Department of Buildings has determined that all tenant spaces are exempt from inspection. When the bill was negotiated with council staff, the understanding was that only residential tenant spaces would be exempt. The law specifies that the inspection must start at the point of entry of gas piping into the building, which is referred to as the POE. If the POE is located inside of a tenant space, the inspector will not have access to it. In terms of gas safety, the POE is ground zero. Most of the hazards an inspector may encounter will be found at this location. Both the Harlem and the Second Avenue incidents could have been identified and reported by a qualified person conducting a periodic gas inspection. In order for those conditions to have been reported, the spaces would first need to have been accessed. Waiving the requirement to inspect the POE due to the presence of a tenant space I'm and direct violation of federal and state gas inspection requirements. If a tenant space precludes an inspector from gaining access to the point of entry, the inspection will be incomplete. Our committees have been working with our industry affiliates on enhanced gas safety training since 2014. The research and studies conducted by our industry partners since that time have provided the scientific data that was utilized to create the periodic gas inspection training program and the inspection protocols that exist today. Without addressing and clarifying these issues, compliance will continue to suffer and some inspections will not provide the level of public safety that the creation of this law has intended. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George, good to see you. Thank you, next up we'll be hearing from April McIver. Time starts now. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Good, great. Um, my name is April McIver. I'm the executive director of the Plumbing Foundation. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization representing plumbing contractors, engineers, supply houses, and manufacturers. Um, I concur with a lot of what Mr. Vasilino just said. Um, I did submit written testimony, uh, which is much more detailed. Um, so please uh, take a look at that when you do get a chance. Uh, generally, we are uh, in support of several several bills on the agenda, including intro 859 and 1746. But I wanna use my time to focus on intro number 2151A, uh, which is extending uh, the compliance date for local law 152, specifically for uh, the buildings and community districts one, three, and 10. Um, you know, as, as everyone here knows, uh, you know, the law was originally passed four years ago. It was supposed to go into effect in 2019 and do to several delays, um, the bill didn't, didn't go into effect until the beginning of this year. Um, so it, I just wanna concur with the, uh, you know, Commissioner LaRocca, we're, we don't have an objection to the extension of the bill, but we do think that uh, the council needs to, you know, weigh the extension with the purpose behind the law and uh, make several considerations, including an application for waiver, an amnesty program, or at least increase the penalties or add additional penalties in a time to cure um, so that building owners do comply with this law. It is a safety law. It's very important. Um, so those are some of the changes. Like I said, uh, we have several recommendations of like eight page uh, uh, testimony. So I'm not gonna go into it, but um, again, the commercial tenant spaces as Mr. Basilino mentioned in the point of entry, those are changes uh, that we do recommend as well to be put in this bill. We think this is a, a great opportunity to make uh, you know, uh, changes to a lot of what we have now seen are our flaws in local law 152 of 2016. Um, so thank you for your time today and please reach out to me if you have any questions about my written testimony. Thank you, next thank will be- Thank you for your testimony. 
Sorry, thank you. Next we'll hear me hear from Arthur Goldstein and then Daniel Himmel, Himmelsbach. Time starts now. Um, I'll just, uh, I represent the Master Plumbers Council. Uh, George has a statement. He, he had four other points to make. If you have time to, to, to hear them, I'll yield the rest of my time. Otherwise, we had submitted testimony. No, Arthur, why don't you just give us the four points? Well, George is the expert. He has it in front of him. So you're yielding your time to George. Go ahead, George. Time starts now. You're, you're on mute. Thank you, everyone. Uh, a couple of other points that we had were the inspection entity. The law provides for a licensed master plumber or their direct employee with five years experience to conduct these inspections. In the past four to five years, as we created the training program, a licensed plumber with his license alone is not qualified in our belief to conduct these inspections. They should have the additional seven hour training that's required of their employees to conduct these inspections. Also, the code requires the employee to have five years experience. The Department of Buildings has created a guest work qualification. We believe that the employee should have that guest work qualification. Why? It proves the five years experience and it also proves that the person has measured knowledge of gas piping systems. Other than that, pretty much our changes are minor. One we would like to bring to the council's attention, which is very important, is if right now, um, what's gonna happen if you don't do an inspection? The enforcement. The rule provides for a $10,000 penalty, but it doesn't force or mandate that the inspection is ever conducted. There's talk now from some building owners, well, I'm just gonna pay the fine because it's cheaper than the inspection. So we would uh, respectfully request that you consider that um, um, when you review this law. And other than that, um, we just made changes in the scope so that the scope would mirror the inspection process, which wasn't complete. Uh, during the time that this law was negotiated. That's it, and uh, thank you everyone for your comments and, and uh, time. So both George and Arthur, you know, in this, in this uh, extension period, it does give us an opportunity to work on the bill. There's no such thing as a perfect bill, and I've been around long enough to know that, but we do have an extended period of time, not only for, uh, for the homeowners to be able to prepare themselves and be educated properly, uh, but also for us to look at some of the the, uh, the changes that you're proposing. So I know that I'm willing to do that, and I believe that uh, uh, Chair of Finance Danny Drum is also willing to do it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like Arthur has his hand up. You don't get any time back, Arthur. What? Just real quick, time is of the essence of the changes because inspections will still be you, 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 you just went on mute again, Arthur, by accident, I think. I didn't do it, I swear. <laughs> uh, my, my quick point is that time is of the essence because uh, these inspections can still be occurring and, and therefore the, the changes that the Master Plumbers Council and others apparently have agreed uh, should take place should be done sooner rather than later so there's clear direction on how the inspection should be done. Okay, so can, um, can you just... Uh, uh, text me, Arthur, and we'll, we'll set up some time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Next up, we have Eric Dillenberger, Chi Osi, and Fior Ortiz. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my company has uh, been installing sprinkler systems for over 30 years, and 100% uh, of our buildings are fully sprinklered. However, uh, every one of those systems was installed prior to any occupancy. I oppose uh, 1146B uh, because it's retroactive. The building code evolves to make buildings progressively safer, more livable, and more energy efficient. However, relatively few of these changes were required to be retroactive because of practicality and expense. Most buildings are in some way non-compliant with the current code. While every single building in New York City could be uh, mandated to be upgraded to the most recent code, where would it stop? The timeline allotted for the proposed bill is grossly insufficient. I doubt there is an adequate supply of licensed mechanical engineers to even design all the systems required in the city uh, in the time budgeted. The expense of retrofitting sprinklers for many buildings will only serve to drive them into bankruptcy. 
A new sprinkler system will often require a new water main, excavating the street and or new water tanks, upgraded structural supports to carry the tanks, pumps and, un and upgraded electrical systems to power the pumps. Add installation inside of occupied apartments, disruption to tenants' lives, lead paint and uh, asbestos laws, and you're looking at a financial and physical pandemonium. As a contractor, I, I, I can't underestimate the extent of this. Without a mechanism for public financing and recovery of the costs of compliance, this is a recipe for economic destruction and physical disruption. And I respectfully submit this may not be the time for this bill. Um, with my remaining time, I'd like to answer uh, your chairperson's question uh, that was asked a while ago about water mains, if you'll allow me. Um, I can tell you that um, if the water main is uh, over, two and a half inches in diameter, you are allowed to come off of it to uh, branch off to supply the sprinkler. But if it's under, and this is an important part, of this, important part uh, you will need a separate water main to come in to supplement. And this is hugely disruptive. And there's another, there was a question within Chairperson Borelli's question, and that is the 40 foot issue. Is this 40 foot to the slab of the top most floor or is it 40 foot to the roof slab or is it 40 foot to the parapet? It's gonna make a huge difference on the count of how many buildings are included in this thing. And there is no distinction made in any of the bill for this. And the building department and the fire department look at those things very differently. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And I'm saying thank you in, in uh... In, uh, for Chair Borelli as well. Thank you. Next up, we have Chi Osi, followed by Fior Ortiz. Time starts now. Good afternoon, honorable members of the council members in attendance, Chairman Cornegy, Chairman Borelli, and my fellow neighbors. My name is Chi Ose, and I live in the 36th City Council District. As a concerned citizen, activist, organizer, and homeowner, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the City Council today and City today. Local Law 152 and Intro 1146 can be discussed together. Both the law and the bill were created as predictive modules to prevent future calamities. Public safety was the goal and the want, something we all desire. However, both approaches lack the nuances necessary to be effective. At present, both will financially burden small home and commercial owners. The boiler inspection law and the DOB's execution of the law lacks proper notice, options being email, letters, social media awareness, and legal notices. It does not protect owners from unscrupulous contractors and could, and could use an amendment that provides subsidies. Intro 1146 is not realistic. The costs associated could ruin some owners, displace residents, and disrupt the health security of everyone. Because of the ongoing pan pandemic, our neighbors are aggravated and fed up with mandates that feel punitive. There are alternatives from extinguishers, detectors, and proper maintenance of the fire hydrants. There are many reasons being expressed to the committee today to amend local law 152 was an extension, but an extension without a rates tier, proper notification channels, and possible subsidies only pauses the problems. There are many reasons being given to the committee to halt intro 1146. The best reason is a question why. Why create chaos in the middle of a health crisis when all the data and statements from the experts, the fire department, show death by fire has trended low for 15 years and there are secure and affordable options. I'm calling on you all today to both amend Local Law 152 with prudence and kill Intro 1146 with impunity. At present, over 1,100 citizens have advocated for the death of this bill, not including the angry crowd on this Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for your testimony. And um, I find your amendments, uh, in term, especially the tiered portion, that very interesting. So we'll, we'll have a conversation about them. Next up, we have Fior Ortiz, followed by A. Gravery, followed by Andrew Lat Latsko. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Fior Ortiz Joyner, president of the V. Bedford Bergen Street Black Association in Brooklyn's Council District 36. I'm in opposition of intro 1146B. I'm all for safety, fire prevention, and life preservation, but this bill will have long-term detrimental effects to communities that are most in need, low income, black and brown. My community is comprised of beautiful brownstones, many of them on landmark blocks. Most of these homes have been owned by the same black and brown families for generations, as well as longtime homeowners. 
Chair Carnegie, with all due respect, I would be deeply concerned and disappointed if you were to support this bill, especially since you have many elderly homeowners in your district who have already been victims of deed fraud and have lost or been close to losing their homes due to liens and other shady practices. This bill will make your constituents even more vulnerable. I personally have received emails and calls from my neighbors who think we are deliberately being targeted. Quite frankly, we do not see this bill, how this bill will benefit us in any way other than to ensure we can no longer afford our homes. The benefactors will be greedy developers who will have the means to buy our homes once we cannot afford the sprinkler upgrades and accumulate huge liens. From the outside looking in, I am sure sprinklers in every building in New York City sounds like a great idea. In the grand scheme of things, it will be a nightmare to the most marginalized and defensible communities. Many homeowners are struggling to pay their mortgages and property taxes, and many renters are struggling to pay their rent to their small landlords. It will cost tens of thousands of dollars to retrofit our properties, especially the buildings that are over 100 years old with many original details. For many of us, our homes are the path to generational wealth. This bill will jeopardize the financial future of many black and brown families. If this bill passes, it will be financially devastating. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz, for your testimony. And uh, as I've mentioned on several of the social media platforms that I've been challenged on this particular bill on, this is a hearing which allows to hear your voice and the voices of all stakeholders. We've heard from engineers, architects, uh, the fire department, fire safety folks, and that's what this is designed to do. Um, so this is not a vote. There's no action being taken today. This is a hearing figuratively and literally to hear the voice of every single stakeholder. Um, and I can assure you as a homeowner of a brownstone in my district, there is no way I would um, uh, vote for or push forward any bill that would disproportionately negatively impact um, homeowners, small homeowners and affect our affordable housing stock. Uh, negatively. So you can count on uh, me as your council member to, to make sure that this bill in its current form, if it does not meet the needs and or disproportionately negatively impacts uh, our folks, is not going to go forward. So, but thank you so much for your advocacy uh, at UN, both UN Chi and everyone else who's on the call from my district. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have A. Gravery followed by Javier Herrera. Time starts now. I'm mute. What? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, let me first start by telling you a little about myself. I was born and raised in Bedford Stuyvesant. My childhood spent on Chauncey Street while my adulthood on Macon Street. I have lived through the crack epidemic and the gentrification of my neighborhood. I currently live in a four-story family brownstone, and this new sprinkler system law, 1146B, seems expensive and rash to people like me, and I have many questions. I value safety. However, a brownstone is not the same type of building as a tower. It seems like small homeowners are being held to task over issues that don't relate. That terrible fire that happened in the city at Trump Tower is just that. It's a tragedy. For this council to now require automatic sprinklers in buildings 40 feet and above, which do not come close to being the size of a tower, it seems unfair. Creating a blanket law that would cover all residences and raise um, and raised in an, excuse me, that will cover all residences just seems uh, very punitive at this time right now. There are better ways to address fire safety. I've heard some with the educational videos. I am for that. Um, I grew up here and my lived experience in Brooklyn has been that it's rapidly gentrifying and this law feels more like it's less about safety and more about current homeowners being vulnerable to being priced out of their homes. Um, I researched the cost of retrofitting an old brownstone like mine, and the sprinkler system is going to be super expensive, anywhere from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand, including getting a new standpipe, including getting uh, access to a new water main, and that other people have already talked about how expensive it is. Um, also, families will have to live in their home while the sprinkler system is being installed. There are many elderly people that are still part of this neighborhood who have many health issues, including my dad, who's a severe asthmatic who lives with me. My neighbor is an amputee. Where are they supposed to live while this long renovation is underway? Is the city paying for relocation? Uh, breaking open walls, ceilings, doors, I'm floors, inspired. excuse me, dust? Okay, um, I would like to finally say, I know that uh, Councilman Cornegie, you said that this was a hearing, but the language of the law says, and I quote, that we have all the owners 
the one year interim report shall contain an affidavit by the owner of the building acknowledging that the sprinklers are required to be installed by December 31st, 2020. So I'm confused. The language of the law is saying we have to have some type of affidavit by 2020 of this year, but you're saying it's, we're at a hearing. So can you please clarify? Thank you very much for everyone who has spoken. Um, so just so I can clarify, and thank you for your testimony. That, that, that bill and all bills and committees across the council have to come to a vote. There's no vote. So it, a bill just doesn't get enacted. It has to be um, voted on and a majority will decide whether or not the bill, or we could look at making amendments to the bill. And I'm gonna to talk to the bill's prime sponsor about uh, some necessary amendments. Uh, but the reason that it, no matter what the bill says, it hasn't been voted on and this today is not a vote, it's only a hearing. Chair, Chair Carnegie, uh want to uh, briefly uh, uh, chime in for a second. I shut my camera off uh, for a little bit because my laptop is dying and I just want the record to reflect that if I if you lose me in, a, in the next uh, five minutes or so, uh, it's because my battery is dead uh, and I apologize to, to anyone. Uh, no problem, uh, Co-Chair. Um, I was actually in your absence holding you down. I actually Took credit for a few things that were you were responsible for in your. Well, I, I heard. I just didn't want to turn turn back on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so next up we have Avi G followed by Nikki Shower. Um, Avi G, go ahead. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Cornegy. Uh This is not directly about fire, but it is about affordable housing and. Uh, I think that as chair, um, you have to be made aware of uh, what's happening. So just very briefly, I was supposed to sign an affordable housing lease on uh, June of 2019, uh, 545 days ago. Um, these were all the documents I gave, 350 documents proving my eligibility. And then the response I got, chair, was this one page letter. After already being approved and supposed to sign, I was told that I was coming to sign a lease. You're rejected for inconsistent information. What happened after that, Chair Carnegie, was 545 days of torture. And with the help of uh, several public officials of integrity, um, I was tentatively supposed to sign a lease 545 days later on December 1st, yesterday. Um, I was approved by the marketing agent who passed my file to HPD for the final review. Now, based on HPD's previous representation, usually that's just a formal thing. Whatever the marketing agent says, HPD approves. My file was passed to HPD last Friday. So, for the past four days, after 545 days of torture, which included homeless shelters, hotels, these four days, HPD has not approved my application and is now requiring more documents, more questions. How about this income? How about this income? What about this? What about this? Chair Cornegy, the council and the administration, if I could just complete here. Hey, I, I want to ask you, do you mind getting on a three-way call with me, you, and HPD? Because we've had similar conversations before, and I, I don't think you're getting the resolution that you need. And it's my goal to, you know, I, I don't, it's hard to do constituent services during a, uh, a hearing, but I would like to uh, get the three of us together, me, you, and HPD, so that we don't, so you, you don't feel compelled to come on uh, uh, the hearings to have a discussion. And I don't want to be callous about what your case is. And so I clearly can't handle it right now during the, the course of a hearing, but I'd like to. Would you be willing to do a three-person conversation between me, you, and the commissioner at sure. HPD? Carnegie, respectfully, there's nothing I want. I would want more, and I don't want to come on these hearings, but, you know, I've reached out to you. Your personal email, I haven't heard back, and th this is a 545 saga of torture that is unnecessary and unmerited. So... I, I would be so happy to have a three-way call. How can we facilitate that? I will call you tomorrow. I have received your emails. Um, if you could just shoot me one that has your phone number in it, I will call you tomorrow. Personally. Thank you for your compassion, sir. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony, Albert. Thank you. Next up, we have Nikki Shower. Time starts now. Nikki, are you there? Okay, uh, I have now sent the same uh, testimony to every council member. I presume most of them have gotten it as I've gotten your, for the most part, the re, uh, automatic response. Fortunately, uh, uh, Speaker uh, Johnson and uh, Councilwoman uh, uh, Rosenthal replied that I could send in my uh, letter uh, to testimony. So I would like to say, I thought I covered every point, but I'm, uh, Representative or Councilman Varelli and Correggi certainly added immeasurably, as did the uh, uh, Commissioner of the DOB, to what the incredibly um, impracticality of this uh, intro 1146B. Uh, I had no idea that. It, this had been done uh, in 2004 in commercial buildings, of which there were only about a thousand versus uh, 85,000 of the residential. And uh, I had known that they might have to put, uh, you know, added roof structure and a bigger water tank, but I had no idea or thought about having water coming from the main. Do we have enough water pressure to even consider it? Um, uh, I am a landlord and I also am a homeowner of a co-op. And uh, as a personal homeowner, I could never afford to do what you're suggesting in my apartment, let alone the incredible disruption. I've lived in my apartment for over 50 years. It is large and it would destroy it. This is a 1909 building. Uh, there's no dropped ceilings. Uh, it, it's all concrete. It would be a disaster. We are putting in, or we will be putting in uh, piping for uh, sprinklers in every apartment we undertake to do renovation in. And that's the best- Time expired. That's the best we can do. And I think that's the most practical thing is that anything coming up where they're doing a gut renovation, that would be the time for sprinklers to be put in. Otherwise, what would you do with all these poor souls? You kick them out of their apartments. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And right now, everybody's suffering financially as well as, I only heard about this by a fluke yesterday. Most people don't even know about this law. I just think it's ill-conceived, not well thought out on the practical basis. And the, my recommendation is you want to put it in, fine, but do it on anything that has not, is undergoing renovation of a large scale. Uh, at the risk of undue familiarity, thank you for your, uh, your comments and your testimony, Nikki. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This concludes the public testimony. We have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify. If that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we will try to hear from you now. I will now turn it over to Chair Carnegie to close the hearing. Uh, thank you so much, Committee Council. Um, I, I just wanna say that this is uh, the epitome or an example of the council's commitment to hearing from every stakeholder on very critical and crucial bills. Um, I think the amount of time that we've spent listening to um, will shape the way the form, you know, the way this bill goes forward. Um, I myself um, was very alarmed to hear the expense in true numbers, uh, what it is from engineers and from plumbers and the disproportionate impact it will have on small homeowners as well as our affordable housing stock. So I, I, I really listened intently um, with the idea of going back and, and, and collaborating with all of the sponsors on all of the bills today to make sure that we are, um, as was mentioned before, following the Hippocratic oath, which is to do no harm 
which is the attention of this council. So thank you everyone for your testimony. Thank you to those for who's, I, I see people on this Zoom who were here from the beginning who stayed the entire time. Uh, thank you for the bill sponsor. Um, and I'd, I'd like to um, have my co-chair uh, close out uh, the hearing as well. Thank you, Chair Borelli, uh, for your input and for your hard work. Thank, thank you very much. I think uh, Councilman Grudenchik also wanted to, uh, to oh. say some final thoughts. Yes. Yes. Um, but just in, in my last uh, second before my computer dies, I, I do want to say thank you to all that, that participated, uh, specifically on 1146, because I think it's important we, we articulate why from a variety of different angles this bill, uh, as it's currently written, uh, might not be the best, uh, number one, for the, the residents, number two, for the landlords, and number three, for sort of the broader community at large. So I appreciate everyone, um, you know, providing their perspective on, on why the problem might exist. And I thank you all and wish you all a, an enjoyable holiday season. And, and, I, and I will give uh, the final word to the bill's uh, prime sponsor who took a pretty much of a beating today, uh, but is very resilient and, 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 and smart and I'm sure willing uh, to have a conversation going forward. Uh, Barry Goodenter. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I really, uh, I enjoyed listening to everybody. Um, and, you know, I've been raised by uh, great people, um, great mentors in public service uh, who taught me that you got to listen. And we've heard a lot today from uh, many, many interested parties, uh, some of whom I met with uh, before this hearing. Um, I've heard from people in the district. Uh, I've heard from people all over. So I will be having a discussion with the chairman. And it's, it's obvious to me, um, and I think uh, to both chairs, that uh, this bill uh, could not, at least my, one of my bills, 1146, uh, could not go forward as is currently written. So I want to make sure to let you know that uh, I was here all day. I heard all the testimony, and I take it to heart. And um, we never want to do any harm. Uh, I grew up in public housing in New York City. I understand how important it is to uh, our homes, our are our castles that comes down to us, whether it's public housing or the fanciest home um, in the fanciest neighborhood, uh, every home is important. We don't wanna disrupt people's lives. So I will be speaking to Chair Cornegie about this and we will go forward from there. And I thank you all again um, for coming forward today as we always do as a city um, to hear each other out and to make uh, all legislation better. So thank you. Thank you chairs and uh, happy holidays. Uh, thank you. Happy holidays to everyone on this call and all your families. Uh, this commences the hearing of housing and buildings uh, scheduled for December 2nd. Thank you so much.